We're good. This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, and you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willard for letting us use his music at our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Oh yes, let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing, and we're going to take a look at campaigns, what a campaign is, and how else we might want to look at campaigns from a structural standpoint. My name is Chris. And I'm Phil. And I'm Old Man Logan. Old Man Logan. So, we're here. It's episode 229. Phil, buddy, old pal, old friend, what is going on? What is going on? Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute. I feel like we're about to get real sad right now. Do you have music? I wish I had music. Right? You didn't kind of prep for this. It's not like you didn't know what kind of mood I was in by the time you showed up. Yeah, but I don't have the ability to put stuff on my soundboard with my laptop for some reason because iTunes hates my laptop. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. What can I say? Here, I got one for you. Nobody knows the trouble I sing. Yeah, anyway. Nobody knows Um, my sorrow. I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm fine, I guess. No, you're Uh, not. Spill it. I'm not. I I got crushed at work today. Um, I mean, pretty bad, actually. Like, the kind of bad that makes me want to go, like, looking for jobs. Oh. Like, the kind that I was like, hmm, I wonder how up-to-date my resume is. (laughs) Um, I mean, I made it through the day cause I was like, well, I'm not going to just, you know, flip two birds and walk out of here, which was my first inclination. Although I did go to Popeye's to eat my, uh, to eat my anger away, uh, continuing my, um, stretch. I don't think the Popeye's people have ever seen me smile. I only, I only show up there. I only show up there like angry face, like, oh, completely angry, angry face, angry face, oh, angry face. Just angry. give me my fucking you know, give me my fucking chicken strips it's like that actor uh yeah. or actress exercise where like angry face happy face except you're just like angry face Arr. yeah you know it's just it's like a thing man like i mean popeyes is where i wash up when i've had like a really shitty day and tuesdays are the magic day tuesdays are the days where i meet with the bosses and i basically just get punted around the room and so that's what happened today so it's I, such a good thing that we record on tuesday nights i swear to god it's not like i planned it that way but it's just turned out that way <laughs> oh anyway it's just like one domino and like a series of things that um I mean, I'll be truthful. I mean, I've been pretty truthful about a lot of things lately. Um, I think I'm actually probably pretty depressed right now. Like, like enough that, I mean, enough that I think I need to talk to my therapist about, like, where does one decide, like, you should take medication for this versus you should just, I don't know, uh, sleep? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just... I just, I I mean, I'm functional, right? Like I'm doing shit. Like I go to work and I'm still designing and stuff like that. But, um, well, but uh, happy from my is not happy is not a word I I've I've used in a while from my armchair psychologist point of view. Like you use design as a coping mechanism and you use gaming as a coping mechanism and they're not really working as well as they used to use podcasting as a coping mechanism and they're not really working as well as they used to. I mean, they're not not working, right? Like, I mean. It's fine. Like, I like doing this stuff, but, like, I'm existing. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. I, I exist. No, yeah. I, I know that feel. I was I was that a decade ago. Yeah, like, that's, like, about all I got right now. Like, I'm existing, and I'm no danger to myself, but I'm, like, at the point, like, I have a therapy session tomorrow, and I kind of feel like I need to ask my therapist, like, when does one, when does one make a decision, like, When do you just start taking medication for this in addition to, you know, in addition to therapy? Yeah. Now, granted, last week I did not have therapy, which I'm also starting to realize is like also problematic. Like I I kind of am almost needing like therapy once a week. Like I had to skip a week because there were no uh, appointments available. Mm -hmm. And like I'm kind of feeling it. And I journaled the shit out of last week. Like I wrote like, I don't know, I don't know, 20. I'm typed, right? I mean, like 20 something pages of, of journal stuff like Anyway, it's like a big giant mess, but I did manage to design a whole bunch of stuff for Hydro Hackers because, yeah, that's, you know, my coping mechanism. And uh, I feel like, I'll be honest, like, it's like the canary in the cage. Mm-hmm. Like, if I can't design Hydro Hackers, then something is, like, really wrong. Like, so- as long as, as long as I can get myself within a couple days to the keyboard and make something... I feel like I'm still okay-ish, but like if I at some point don't want to work on Hydro Hackers, it's kind of like, 
that might be a sign. When I was in the same spot that you were in a long time ago, I wrote a 37,000 word novella and 40 short stories in 10 weeks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, so I get it, man. Yeah, man. Like I'm trying, right? Like, I mean, but here's the things like I, I like this three day weekend, right? Like I didn't watch any Luke Cage. Uh, to be honest, I also wanted to and didn't watch uh, Young Justice because I knew that I know that new podcast is coming out. Whelmed with Rich uh, Howard. I know. And I, I like I want I really want to listen to it because I love Rich Howard. But I'm like, I really kind of need to watch Young Justice. Mm -hmm. Plus, I need to watch Young Justice anyway because I really want to play Masks. So I found a game that we'll talk about later that that is the superhero game that I really want to play. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. then I'm excited. Um, anyway. All right. So I'm alive. Um, I exist. I go to work. And uh, every now and then I scratch out a little happiness. But for the most part, it's uh, kind of just this bleak existence. Anyway. How are you, Bob? <laughs> I am uh, considerably better. Um, I have my own set of issues, <laughs> but, yeah, but they are not anywhere near, you know, the kind of thing where, you know, therapy is required. Can, can I ask a question? Should we just call what's going on therapy session? Like, like, can we just... Like, no, man. I mean, if you want to have therapy session, man, like, I mean, I'll, I'll crack open the journals, man. Like, no. we, we can go... Okay, like, never we can, mind. We'll do group. Yeah. yeah, we'll do group, right? We'll do group therapy. I mean, we could do that as a patron... Like uh, exclusive yeah, do, like do, if do you really want to see like do you folks want to hear us because i have a whole yeah, rss circle. feed set up for you patrons these days like yeah rss I mean, feed the patreon feed that is like for like the after show and stuff i mean if days. you really just want to see phil's psyche like dumped out on a table like we can do that i mean we're gonna have to put some tags on it right like oh, yeah. like explicit it's gonna uh, be explicit it's gonna it's, be dark it's yeah. yeah it's it's um i mean there's definitely going to be some stuff right yeah. absolutely um anyway yeah, we sure yeah. we can do that. Patrons can patrons can certainly just ask if uh, if they want uh, uh, what you call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, you know what I do want to say real quick before I kick it over to you, sure, Bob. Um, I'm going to put this out there. Hey, um, if you are a listener of Misdirected Mark and you are interested um, in playtesting Hydro Hackers, Hydro Hacker Operatives is the actual formal name. Um, I'm getting to the point where. Um, I'm going to put together by the end of October, I'm going to put together a playable ash can version of the game. It won't be complete. Um, there's some chunks that I'm certainly not going to put in and I'll know what those are by the end of this week, but I want to start playing it. I'm not ready to release it to blind play testing. It's, it's in alpha, not beta. Yeah. It's yeah. super alpha and I, I need to see it in action, but I need to play it with a bunch of different people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will have playbooks that are advanceable as opposed to a QCC, which playbooks that had one move. Um, these actually are fully, I, fully I, full playbooks. I can just evil hat it up if you want, and I can make a Google sheet for you and put it in the community. Well, and here's what I was going to here's what I was going to say. Um, if people are interested, uh, people can email me phil at misdirectedmark.com. Are you sure you want to do it that way? Or you want me to put a Google sheet up for you to, so you can peruse? Um, no, it's OK, because I, I think I want to talk to people. OK. Um, I think I want to talk to people. I There are a couple of people I'm hoping, like Victor Wyatt, I'm hoping will um, reach out. I, I was just going to reach out to him, but if he winds up reaching out to me, that's fine. Um, but there are other people. And, and th the only requirements are I'm going to play the game by Hangouts. Um, I'm on the East Coast, but I obviously, since I record with Senda, I have no um, discernible sleep patterns. <laughs> so um, late night games are possible. Um, weekend games are probable. Uh, weeknight games are more likely, but whatever. Um couple hours some of the playtest groups will just be one shots some of them will be um, multi-session because i want to do the neighborhood mechanics mm -hmm. but i need to do that and i need to actually start getting that into a regular rotation because i need to start beating on this game yeah yeah absolutely so if you're interested um just reach out to me it's fine I, i'm actually okay with it it'll be nice to actually um it'll be nice to actually talk to people and then i'll just start putting people into a group there we go all right bob awesome so now back to your uh, yeah. your woes. Um, to to piggyback onto one thing, um, having lived with a person who is on medication for depression for 15 years, um, definitely ask about the meds. Mm -hmm. Definitely ask because there's there's the worst that can happen is I'll let you know when you're ready or you know you're not ready for it or whatever. But you know, well, yeah, that's I yeah. I kind of figure like yeah. I mean, but, yeah, ask. I don't I don't think I yeah. say like hey I need meds. <laughs> yeah. like, I just you know at some point somebody should you know probably know that yeah exactly. i feel like i'm in that range yeah so um yeah i'm uh 
uh, in the middle of my own um, work. Um, Core Crisis now has a new set of prototype cards. Looks snazzy, man. And Because uh, I like to play with, with layout and, and graphic design a little bit myself. And so I put together a new set of cards, and I'm going to put together a new set of uh, room tiles. Yeah. Because we need those. And um, we're going to get ready. To, we're going to bang out another test of that. It's very exciting. Um, so that's fun. Um, I ordered myself a 3D printer. <gasps> yes, I'm so excited it's about not, that. It's not even ordered. Oh, it arrived today. Yeah, oh. it's, it's here. It's literally here. I'm I mean, it's exciting. not here. Not here, but it's at my house. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. Yes, I need to make room to put it on the desk where it's not going to be sitting like on papers that could catch on fire or anything. Uh, oh, yeah. Can, can, we, can we get you to make the, the MM logo? Absolutely. I mean, it's like, like, like that, the first that shit I'm gonna do for that, a test. That shit we can do, right? Like, yeah, we have. It's not like we don't have the vector graphics. There things may or for may it. not be some kind of tchotchke coming Ooh. because I had the test. So you know, I, I'm just excited from the fact that for prototype purposes, oh, yeah. you literally can now just make your own pieces. And believe me, I was looking on the web at um, I don't know, like ThingMaker or one of those websites. Yeah. at some of the things that other people have already made, and it's ridiculous the stuff that you can make with this that I hadn't even thought of like dice you can make custom dice yeah there there are a couple things we may for hydra hackers tinker around with because sure. I use glass beads for the bag mm-hmm. um but one of the things I realized that's a problem is for accessibility purposes um if you are visually impaired uh the glass beads do you no good Oh, so yeah. it'd be good to have some sort of visual thing. In, and on if the you're colorblind, the, the glass beads are actually yep. problematic because green and red are two of the colors in the game. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not ready to do it yet, but there are thoughts of like two color to like a token with a symbol. Yeah. But you can't feel the symbol. Yeah. Like it's in, like it's it's embedded, you know, at the same level as the surface. Yeah. yeah. But it's you know like a G. It's an R, it's a B. And this way, if you're colorblind and you take the token out, um, you can't see the color, but you could see like the like the yeah, letter in the There's definitely middle. ways to do that. Yeah. So. Anyway, anyway, I just I, I think yeah. it's pretty badass. And people have made like trays for organizing like cards and 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 bits for games. I'm getting itchy. I'm, like, oh, I'm man, getting itchy I, right I totally now. I didn't even think of it. So yes, 3D printer is gonna be fun. Um that's going to be a thing. Uh, and, um, what else? Uh, and I wrote something else in the show notes that I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, you won a game of Settlers of Catan. I, I won a frigging game of Settlers of Catan. Now, people who, who don't know, um, I have played probably 15 to 20 games of Settlers, okay? Including the Star Trek variant. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. So out of those, I have come close once, and I just literally won my first game. All the other times, that game mercilessly crushes me. <laughs> crushes me. Well, congratulations. Whatever numbers you think are going to come up on those dice, if I'm on those numbers, those numbers don't come up. <laughs> and, and you were playing with uh, Nikki, and I've never beat Nikki at Settlers. Yeah. I think it's because they have the old school set, and all the games that I've played have been with the new set, with the with the the borders that go yeah. around it that snap into place and all the, you know, the, the, the fancy, fancy, fancy yeah. it went old school and it went, Oh yeah. Hey, well, they recognize this old, <laughs> yeah. right? Cause you're old. old hey, old. can we just real quick, give a quick shout out to Nikki who, um, airdropped, Absolutely. who airdropped beverages for us. Beverages. This evening. Yeah. Yes. I might be drinking, um, apple cider with Jack Daniels fire and apple cider whiskey in it. Yeah. I'm drinking my favorite. Uh, this is the local spot coffee. Um, this ice, is their ice iced, brew? Yeah, this is. I can drink. This yep. is. Uh, this is black. Like that's how good their iced coffee is. And it's flavored tea. Yeah. So um, she's I mean, she's awesome. She airdropped caffeine to us, and yes. um, oh, we I should never. Coffee. We should we should never take that for granted. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Nikki rocks. Thank you. You were the best. So that's right. me. Nothing's ever hey, gonna uh, let you down. What about you, Chris? How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Um, I am. I had three weddings in two days. And you love weddings. I like them. I like them less right now. Yeah. (laughs) No, man. Weddings are fine. Uh, Yeah, weddings are fine. Okay. Uh, Am I? uh, So Nikki got married on Friday. I was there, and on Saturday, my good friend Katie 
uh, tangent tangent twin Katie. Yeah. Cheese girl Katie. She got married to uh, Mike Willard, who does the music for our show. Yep. I, their pictures from their wedding were delightful. Yeah. Like, and, she looked adorable in her in her dress. And, Nikki looked wonderful in her dress as well. Mm-hmm. I actually had Nick. I had um, lunch with Nikki the morning of her wedding yeah. at Wegmans after she'd already gotten her veil. <laughs> so she's like, you know, she's like in a dress, <laughs> like in her regular clothes, but with a veil yeah. sitting with me at Wegmans. She, eating. She, she was saying it was hard to drive around with it on because yeah. you had to lean forward and she couldn't sit back. It was yeah. pretty hilarious. Well, cause it's, it's, it's a veil. Yeah. 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 Uh, then my, uh, my cousin Tyler, who, uh, he's the, we, we talked about him last week, the comic book artist, yeah, yeah. four kids walked in a bank, which by the way, Fraser uh, Simmons, he put up, he posted a picture of, he actually owns, he has, he bought the comic book. Oh, he, sweet. he had it for a while. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend Four Kids Walking to a Bank. Great book. Um, and then it was his wedding. So I didn't go to sleep until like five in the morning on uh, on Saturday after three weddings. So uh, Sunday, I was a waste and a wreck. <laughs> yeah, I talked to you for a few minutes on Sunday. You um, was hung over as hell. You didn't sound good. No, no, I no. didn't. I mean, I didn't sound any better than you when I, you know, wasn't hung over. But... <laughs> uh, then on Monday, which was Columbus Day, uh, way to little cultural appropriation and uh, celebrating somebody who's terrible. Anyways, send your political opinions <laughs> or about history. Uh, to, celebra- to celebrate, I oppressed my kids all day. <laughs> like, there you go. I uh, took all their stuff and like, you know, I like went in their rooms. I took all their shit and, and like renamed their rooms. Oh, I just said man. they were, these, these were now my rooms. Yeah, it's fine. I'm just, yeah. I'm just joking around. Uh, no, it's okay. I mean, you know. So to celebrate, I ran some D&D for some new folks. I was like, what do you guys, what do you folks want to play? And half of them were like, we want to play uh, survival horror. And the other half were like, we want to play Spelljammer. Uh, yes, we can do both. And we did both. That's right. There you go. <laughs> That's what happened. Bob once did that, actually. Bob ran a survival horror Spelljammer game. Really? Oh, it was aboard this like dead pyramid. Oh, oh it was nice. Fucked. I mean, it was fucked in that, first of all, it was like a pyramid of undead. We found it floating in space. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, let's board this fucker and like raid it. And then it all goes to shit, right? Liches and fucking zombies and shit like that. Mm -hmm. And no fucking treasure. (laughs) Like, we abandoned this fucking crumbling, this fucking undead ridden, crumbling pyramid in space, fleeing for our lives back to our ship. Not a fucking penny among us for all, all our endeavors. I don't think I think to this day Bob still gets shit about not putting a piece of treasure in that. Pretty much. So we are explicit, and you have been warned. I know we usually don't swear a ton, a ton, but the worse of a mood that Phil is in, the more he swears. Just so everybody knows, and also the more drunk Phil is, the more he swears. That's true. Those are those are also accurate. Yeah. Uh, Mine was so my spell jammer doesn't look like everybody else's spell jammer because it's more sci-fi. Like I actually have like metal and like keypads and technology and stuff and laser guns yeah that's 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 cool that's my spell jammer because i think that's how spell jammer should be so i mean that mine looked a little bit more like that but it also i like that so i like that uh that juxtaposition of that sci-fi sort of uh rocket age like mm-hmm. curves and rockets and, and metal technology sure. with like fantasy doors and stuff no yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah or, i get that or yeah. like when you walk inside of a place it's like futuristic on the outside then you walk in it's like england with carpets on the inside victorian style because of the gif yeah. things like that like that's that's my spell jammer oh the fucking gif i love the gif they're terrible oh, <laughs> they're, awesome. <laughs> they're awesome in a in a terrible way all right so there was that and uh yeah man i uh i've been just writing stuff and editing podcasts and i started a thing today which i would like to see people do um hashtag one tweet adventure hashtag one tweet adv so tweet your at me with this hashtag uh one tweet adv and put a line in that's like one tw- it's it's like uh an adventure idea in one tweet no in 140 characters minus the hashtag correct and i will collect them all and Legit. post them at some point oh that's fun yeah so i put three up today and hopefully other people will nice and i'll i'll do i'll have that posted next monday for well, maybe i'll do it. some of those yeah i mean confined to my desk to make schedules for the next couple of days so i'm sure that i'll i will rebel and um, play with Twitter while I'm sitting at my desk. All right. So before we get to our feature segment, the workshop, yeah, we're going to talk about short versus long campaigns. We're going to talk a little bit about the character cache. Hey, I know that thing. So yeah. <laughs> this is the other thing I did all weekend. You did. Many of them are now for sale on Drive Through RPG. Uh, all of them. All of them. Well, all of them, including Idris. It's, yeah. Um. No. Yes. Idris will come out next month, or is she out there? I didn't notice. Shit, I don't know. Go well, check. You, you go anyway, check. Like, I'll check. You you start talking. So, well, I, I have the wrong information here because you have these priced differently than me. You have to tell people. Okay, let me. You look it up. Or, okay, or he looks. It you up, look and it up. I'll. That's his job. Okay, and I'll and I'll talk about it. All right. So here's what we did. Uh, as people know, uh, we have a Patreon. 
the character cache where every month people vote and uh, Matt Morrow draws these amazing characters and um, and then we put uh, a write up and then we put stats and um, up up today we put stats for uh, Fate Savage Worlds and Fifth Edition. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't always do that in the past, correct? Because in the past we were um, building up to those goals. Anyway, um, so we were just sitting on them. Yeah, like, they were just hanging out. They were just hanging out in a, in a directory, and we were like, well, shit. And a lot of people asked how could they get them. Right. It, like, newer patrons asked how they could get them. Um, plus, we realized that a lot of people just don't do Patreon. That's true. They just don't. They just don't. Um, so what we did was we've now taken the entire backlog, and there's a year's worth. Uh, there are 12 characters, and we moved them. Uh, we put them up now on DriveThru. So you can go to Drive Through RPG. You can search for character cache. Um, or you can search for encoded designs because there's now a product line. You will see the character cache logo. You can click on it and see all the uh, characters. You can now go and get any individual character you want from the character cache. Uh, each one of them has a write-up, and they tell you which systems they have um, they have stats for mm -hmm. because they're not all consistent. That's true. And the way we priced them is it's a dollar per PDF page. Page, yes. It's a dollar per page for the character. So, for instance, if the character has a write-up and all three sets of stats, it's three ninety-five. If the character has a write-up and just the fate stats, which is like the early characters, mm -hmm. then it's a dollar ninety-five. Mm -hmm. um, they're not terribly expensive. Oh, and the other thing we did, little bonus, we threw an image in. Um, it's it's got the character cache logo and stuff on it, so you can't. Um, take it and do everything you want with it but if you just wanted like a picture to hold up and show people yeah. of the character we threw one of those in there as well um but anyway you can now get the you can get the old characters and they are um if i, I will say that they are all actually pretty awesome i actually love every one of those characters yep. individually they're pretty great um they're written by a number of us you've written some mm -hmm. um i've written some Merwin. It's what makes them cool is because it's not just one person that's written them all. Right. They, and they Arcadia. have different looks at they, they different pers uh, yep. perspectives. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you actually you actually can um, you can actually see which one of us wrote it. Um, they span a number of different genres. So we have some fantasy ones. We have some cyberpunk ones, some modern mm -hmm. urban. Uh, we have some urban modern slash urban fantasy. Correct. Because a lot of the ones we did for modern have an urban fantasy twist it's to them. True. Um, like Harley Chase. Yep. 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 Um, I did two of them actually because I did Harley Chase and I did Maureen. You did the, yep. the detective, Dru the Druid mm -hmm. detective. Yep. Um, anyway, those are up. And then for patrons, as not to panic and don't flee our Patreon um, campaign, the patrons will one get to vote. Yes. Two, uh, they get the character cash actually cheaper because yep. they get it at three dollars as opposed to three ninety five. That's accurate. Yep. Um, and as long as I did not put eyes, you did not. I did not put. Um, I did not put her the September character up. Um, we will be putting them up one month after the Patreon, after the patrons get it. So you so, get them all earlier. Yes, yeah, so you actually get it earlier. Um, so all the reasons not to flee the Patreon, <laughs> Patreon actually campaign. Maybe join the Patreon campaign. If anything, come join the Patreon campaign because it only will get better as we get more money. Yeah. That's true. Um, and you do get early access, and you do get to vote, and yes. you get it cheaper, and you and you do get it like a dollar cheaper. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's out. I will start experimenting with some bundles. Because I'm going to start putting together bundles of like all fantasy characters, or um, the pulp characters, those kinds of things. I'm going to like I'm going to make some bundles. I may even make some system specific ones. Like you can get just the fate block. And when those happen, we will let you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And and we're going to pump out a whole bunch of information about the character cache on drive through on all of our social media starting in the next day or two when I kind of get off my ass and do it and we will never talk about the character cash this month much again unless we do something <laughs> we new. seriously won't but we really <laughs> just needed to let people know like we've put it out on drive through yeah. it's a thing yep okay cool well, let us move on to the next thing then we will be right back well we're gonna go to the workshop so here you go welcome to the workshop where we try to build better games. So today in the workshop, we're going to talk about short versus long campaigns because it's something that came up uh, last week in our conversations and uh, I wanted to talk about it this week. And Phil, you put a lot of this stuff together for us because you always do that. That's like uh, kind of your your niche in this, in this uh, podcast. So would you do me a favor and define the word campaign? Right. Hmm. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, it's a shitty... Um, 
it's a, it's a, it, it's not a well it's not a well defined word. It's not well defined for the purposes of role playing games. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of bad. And so I, I actually pulled, um, actually pulled three different definitions. Um, so first of all, I pulled a definition from uh, the nomenclature. So um, if you ever go to the gnomes do website, uh, we gnomes have a um, we have a uh, glossary of gaming terms called the nomenclature. You can find it on the top toolbar. Uh, so I looked up that one, uh, and I don't remember who wrote the original entry for this, but I thought the um, definition was good enough. A linked series of adventures, usually with a central theme or storyline that ties them together. I think that's pretty good. In yeah, fact, that sounds pretty good, right? In fact, on maybe episode one of the Gnome cast when it comes out, we talk a little bit about continuity, and that kind of comes up. Yeah. Um, here's the one from Wikipedia, right? Because, you know, one should always check Wikipedia. Absolutely. Uh, in role-playing games, a campaign... Uh, is a continuing storyline or set of adventures typically involving the same characters. Sure. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, in Odyssey, I actually, uh, because, you know, surprise, surprise, I define campaigns um, in a book about campaigns. Wow. I I am so surprised, Phil. Like, I can't believe that that happened. You defined a thing. You know what's what's actually funny? I defined it before that became a shtick. I know. Like, I went back and looked. I'm like, oh, I did write a kid definition for this thing. Like, <laughs> good job, Past Phil. Good job, Past Phil. Yeah. Um, so, Past Phil writes, uh, a campaign is a series of gaming sessions focused on a group of characters, which maintains a sense of continuity. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, there's no one good definition. But here are the things I picked out from those three definitions. Um, here's what, here, here's, here are the elements that I, I th- like, you can focus in on. Uh, series and continuity. Right. There's an idea that campaigns are more than one adventure or story. Yes. Okay. A central theme. So there's an idea that they're not episodic, right? That they're serial in nature. Or if they are episodic, episodic. if they are episodic, they have a, they have a theme that spans across all of them. Correct. Like Star Trek, the next generation. Yes. Um, Continuity. Like continuity is important. Like things that happen in the past have repercussions in the present and in the future. For instance, in Star Trek The Next Generation, since we started there, Q knocks the Enterprise into the uh, Alpha Quadrant? Uh, no, the... Um, Delta Quadrant. Delta yeah. Quadrant? Delta or Gamma? Whatever. In some far-flung yeah, to quadrant. To find the Borg. Yeah. And, and they meet the Borg. And then he brings them back. But then later that season, the Borg show up and mess everything up. Exactly. Um, yeah, and then, for instance, if we're looking at... Um, also, Q is a recurring character. Q is a recurring character. Um, the big battle with the Borg at Wolf three five nine. Um, it it, uh, it cascades through history at that point. It's an important point in history. It's also an important point in DS nine. Yep, that too. Right, because it plays a role in Cisco's background. Anyway, continuity. That's a that's important. Uh, and same characters. Um, but although I put this one as kind of a weaker one, same characters I don't think is a huge requirement because I think cast shuffle. We see this in TV shows. We see this in books. Um, there'll be some characters who make it all the way through a campaign and then there'll be ones that shuffle in, shuffle out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one I, to me wasn't as really as strong, but I, I did want to note it cause it kind of comes up in those, in, in some of those definitions. So how about reoccurring elements then? And we define elements as characters, locations. Yeah, absolutely. There's def- yeah. If we, if we want to, if we want to abstract that up a layer, um, then yeah. And reoccurring elements. Yeah. Same elements. Yeah. Uh, and that could be setting, mm-hmm. like you said. Okay, here's what's not present in any of those definitions. And this is where you and I, uh, when we started this talking about long versus short campaigns. Um, this is the thing that's really missing. This is the thing that's missing. There's no talk of number of sessions. That's correct. Uh, calendar length. Mm-hmm. Uh, number of stories to be completed. Like, um, none of those exist. So... For the purposes of talking about length, it this this word is useless. <laughs> exactly. Except for more than one. Right. Like, a campaign is a thing, but it's not really a thing of any given length. Yes. So, talking about a short versus long one, we're going to kind of need a better definition. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, <laughs> so... And for anybody who thinks that you know a campaign when you see it, no, you don't. No, because um, because I've asked people and everybody, I've gotten different answers from a lot of people. Sure, and we're going to start using some other terms that are going to, um, I think, do a better job. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for instance, um, so here's, I mean, here's why this definition sucks, right? Because if we talk about number of sessions, 
I've run one shots that have gone over more than one session. Yeah. Yeah. Like my action movie world took three sessions to play. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a campaign. It was, it was, it was exactly a one shot. Yeah. It was one story. Okay. Um, and I've run campaigns that have ended in three sessions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, beginning, middle, end. Yeah. So it's not so. And, and that beginning, middle, end, that's something we'll talk about. In a second, just a second, because yeah. I have some things I have some thoughts about it. Cause it it's it's really important, but it has some variables. I'm I'm just gonna throw in a dissenting opinion here on one one thing from the from the player's perspective. To me, if it's more than one session, that's not a one shot. Uh I now, don't. One shot is one and done. We go in, we sit down, mm. we do a thing. It's done. We walk away, and we never do it. You might as well just stick a pin in that. I'm just saying it's no to me. No, it's fine because because my definition of a one shot is it's it's one. Well, see now we got to talk about some other terms. Say it now, and then we'll define it later. It's one One, story. One story, beginning, middle, end. And and we have a very specific definition of what a story is for this purpose. I don't even know if story is the right word for it, but we'll get to it. Because sometimes those two things wind up the same a story that's told in one session. And sometimes it's a one story that's told in multiple sessions, but it's still just a story. Yes. Story is the word that I'm having a hard time with, but we'll get to that. Yeah. I don't know if I have a better one, but I don't yet either, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about the it. Pot. No, it's fine. It's fine <laughs> because it, it, it's fine because it goes to, it goes to the difficulty of trying to define this by length. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's some other terms that have boundaries mm-hmm. um, that are slightly better defined. Uh, session. Session being the thing where we sit down at the table, we play a game, and then we get up from the table and leave. Okay? What we play, regardless of what we play, session. And that is that, that, even that is variable because a session can take, if you're going to uh, go with Senda's five-minute RPG, five minutes. And a session can also take an hour if we're playing Swords Without Master for one motif. And a session can also take six, six hours like it did for my Spell Jam game that I played yesterday. Uh, yeah. Session uh, So session is, I think, best defined as the time you sit down to the time you get back up. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so there's some, there's some wiggle room in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, adventure slash module. Yes. Like, so, that's a thing. Yeah, and that's even... Yes, it is a thing. So, uh, well, when I was a kid, so like, let's go we, back. To we the, bought them, so it's like you you buy like yeah. the Temple of Elemental Evil, at, uh, just the Moat House one, which is S one basically, which has right. hom- uh, hom- Hamlet, the village of Hamlet, yep. and uh, the temple, the, yep. the the one that uh, Lareth the Beautiful is in. Yep. But then there's two, three, and four, which are the Temple of Elemental Evil. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean the uh, the G series. Right, so G one against the giants, G right. one, the, G- hill, the e- hill giant. Each one of those is an individual adventure, individual module. Right, so we define module as basically the public, the published material, mm-hmm. which usually the published material, if written well, is um, we go to a place, and then we leave the place. Yeah, like I mean, that's a lot of them are site based. Yeah, I mean, in the early days, site based was a um, was a was a big deal. It's because the dungeon was the thing, but now we have different ones. There's there's the heist. Yeah. Like you write a heist up. Yeah. There's and there are and that's where we get to the next term, yeah. which is nebulous, but I think it's better than adventure slash module. Mm-hmm. Because module was easy because I can hold it. Right. Yeah. Like I can hold um the temple, you know, like I I'm sorry, I can hold Expedition of the Barrier Peaks yeah. in my hands. Yes, you can. Okay. That's it, it's a thing. It gets crazy though when you start thinking about the bigger book things like they have now for D anD D. Like uh, the Storm King's Thunder is a campaign in a book, but it's, it's, is that a module or is it an adventure? Like well, exactly. <laughs> is it is it a collection of modules? Yes, bound? it's actually that. It is actually that. Yeah. Um, because if we look at it, it's a um series of sites. Correct. Okay. Um, story. So story. Go ahead, do your thing because then I have things oh, to I have things to say about it. It's fine because I don't have a really great one, but st- story is like an like an adventure. It just doesn't have to be site-based. Mm-hmm. All right? It's um it's so really adventures are stories. They they fit under the heading. Fingers and thumbs. The modules fit under fender under story. Yeah, fingers and thumbs. Yeah. Um has a beginning, middle, end. Now. Yes. Right, like in, that in is, seventh grade, can I draw? Because I know you hate this, because you have a, you actually have a writing degree, and I, on the other hand, like went to well, seventh grade I, I, English. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. <laughs> it. It has, you know, it has a rising action, a climax, 
denouement. Like it's it's that little mountain thing that I drew like a thousand times in seventh grade. Yeah. So, um, uh, so yes. that right. Like for, for now, we'll talk about that, and then you can do the last one that you have here, and then we'll talk about my uh my note that I have about the story. Sure. Uh, and then arc. So arc is a series of stories that tell a larger uh that reveal i guess a larger plot i don't because i then i want to no, use they, the word story again. they tell a larger story they do tell a larger story but it's comprised of it's the, multiple it's the problem why the story is the problem right it's comprised of multiple stories it's almost fractal in nature right like each story has a beginning middle end then the arc has a begin beginning middle end made up of of individual stories so this is one of those times that we can actually talk about writing as far as adventure design and adventure and campaign play yeah. actually go. Uh, there is, there's a thing that happens in writing, especially adventure story writing called the try fail cycle. Like you start your story off and you introduce your characters and you introduce your initial issues. And we actually do a lot of that with play. That's our, that's our session zero. That's our setting up our campaign. Sure. Or even session one sometimes. And, and sometimes session one, because if, if you're playing um, certain games, they don't let you have that, like, well, let's define the issues before we start play. Right. Right? Like, and that's not define the character issues. Like, they arise out of play. Yeah. So the early sessions or your session zero, your session one, is your beginning. The middle of, your, of the game is this try-fail cycle. Right, that is that is the middle part. So right. you're trying and you're failing and you're trying and you're failing until you complete the thing, or you're overcoming obstacles. Even like you're you're trying and over and climbing over the wall and trying and climbing over the wall until you get sure. to your end, which is a rest point. Yes. Now, ends are strange because the the rest points, um, if they are true endings, there's no more questions to ask. Like we've we've answered all the questions that we care to a that we that we've cared to ask. Sure. If they are part of something larger. Then we, or if they have the potential to go on, we leave those questions unanswered, or we reveal new questions, or we reveal new questions. Okay. So instead of a, I mean, those are basically stories. Can, so can I give? Can I give what I think, using your terms? Can I give what I think a story and a arc would be like? Sure. All right. So let's say we have an arc that is uh, destroy the Dark Overlord. The, dark, the the story is the dark overlord is going to come kill is going to come and conquer everything. You want to use a a, a do you want to use a real world example? No, no, I'm just going to I'm going to settle on this one. Okay. okay. All right. So so that's our arc, right? Mm -hmm. The and and we introduce the dark overlord and the dark overlord's minions are going to do stuff and then there's a climax where we have to fight the dark overlord and then hopefully we've we we're just going to say we killed the dark overlord. Yeah. Now, if I'm plotting this as a campaign, if I'm plotting this as an arc, as a GM, that's like my big, like that's my arc, right? I, I set that up. Mm -hmm. Now, underneath, inside that arc, I'm going to say, okay. Um, that's your goal that you've set for the player characters yeah, to achieve. That's my, right. So now underneath it, I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to have a story um, that brings the characters together, introduces the threat, that kind of thing. Then I'm going to have another story where um, the players are told by the high clerics uh, that you need three components of you know that you need this mystical weapon that was broken in three parts in order to kill the dark overlord sure so now adventure three is obtain part one mm -hmm. you know component one four is you know part is component two and then here i'll give you is, one better right five is uh you threaten somebody that's important or something that's important to the characters so right. then you have that breakup yep. of, of of the story beat sure. then, and then, then six is get the third part six is get the third part uh seven is break into his you know, break into her castle. Eight is the final comfort, final confrontation with the Dark Overlord. Nine is like the aftermath. Yeah. So really, okay. really seven is break into the castle and defeat her. I mean, it's one longer story. Yeah. Unless, unless like it's um, right now, I may go, with, I may go, I may personally go with two because the story might, you know, I might, I might beef up that break in mm -hmm. to be a lot of stuff. Ah, see, that's a thing though. Like if that break in is a lot of stuff. It's a bunch of little stories within that story. It could be yeah. at, the, at, at that point. You're, you're that. See, that's where. Right. So I call them cycles. Like cycles? there's this okay. cycle, and yeah. this, and and like I said, that that end point is where you can de determine what kind of cycle that you've just gone through. Right. So now to make this even worse, <laughs> okay. So we have the arc, and we have these individual stories. It may take one or more sessions for me to get through each one. Correct. So I mean, the Airy Peaks was a perfect example of that. Yeah, I mean, there were some, there were certain stories in the Airy Peaks that took us 
two to three sessions to complete. There were other ones where we were in and out in one night. Mm-hmm. Okay. The three pillared room, the three pillared cavern took five. Yes. Okay. Now, we were supposed to talk about length, uh, short versus long campaigns. Yeah. Let's take a breather. Mm-hmm. Let's hit the chat room for life. Yeah. And then let's come back around and talk about what what the point of all this was. Yes, anyway. let's do that. Okay. Absolutely. Let, let, let people's brains cool off for yeah, a second. Yeah, absolutely. So what are people saying? <laughs> Kevin Lovecraft wants to know where his damn Patreon Slack channel is. Joke, joke, laugh, laugh. No, it's, that's <laughs> it's, legit. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> he said, no hurry. You get, we, we have enough stuff to do. So that's, that's cool. I think um, you'll see it in November. <laughs> that's a thing. Could be a thing. Anything else? Yes. Um, there was a, a discussion of the um, five-minute RPG that Senda likes to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and people are talking about the It's Not My Fault cards. Uh, yeah, they're awesome. They're great, yeah. Those things are great. And um, and uh, and my T-shirt was a topic of conversation. Oh, the Chi Burton. Uh, Burton and Chi 2016. Burton and Chi 2016. That's it's all in the reflexes. Baby. You know what? I, I'm going to write that in. <laughs> I, I like this one better than uh, Giant Meteor because you know Giant Meteor is kind of. I liked Cthulhu. Yeah, I like Cthulhu why, too. I, why, why settle for the lesser? Why settle for the lesser evil? Because I'm not sure that voting for Trump isn't any different from voting for Cthulhu. Uh, Republicans can send their hate mail to Chris at misdirectedmark.com. It's fine. Which will forward to Phil at misdirected. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, look, honestly, at this point, send your hate mail to me. I'll I'll, I'll write it. I'll write back to you. <laughs> and, and honestly, I don't really have too much of problem with like. Republican policy most of the time like I get it like, hey save it for the after show yeah. that's the thing patrons can enjoy <laughs> yeah that's true no need for us to get into politics on this show that's true I think that, 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 that's after show material my friend bump, so uh... yeah there you yeah, go let's, everybody let's let's right. not wade into that <laughs> we'll turn around and we'll wade back into the main topic oh is that what we're doing now no, yes, nothing else going on there we're good all right cool so what is the point of this all right so here's the thing right the original question was to talk about short versus long campaigns, except yeah. that I think we've gone to a pretty heroic length to explain that the definition the by itself, the de- definition of campaign doesn't have a length specified. Yes. So in order for us to talk about short versus long campaigns, we're going to have to add another term in. I agree. And I are you comfortable with arc? I am. I okay. am very comfortable with arc because it's something that we can see in pop culture. Yeah. So, let's so it's not, something we can define. So we don't need to and fractal it, down yeah. into arc. I mean, because aside, aside from defining it, we can point at lots and lots of real world examples, which oh, is useful. TV is a great example mm-hmm. of this, right? Like we can see this in many things. Um, so I like I like arc as well um, because, as you pointed out, story is a bit nebulous and session isn't a, as Bob right. pointed out, session's session's also tricky Mm -hmm. but arc is something like i feel like i can say to you like this is an arc and you would be like yeah i think you're right yeah and what happens one layer one fractal down from that i'm okay not being hard like i'm okay with not pinning down i think arc is the important thing okay so now now we can say that a campaign um is made of one or more arcs Yes. Legit? Yeah. And then an arc would be the shorter version of that. Yeah. Like arc is the thing. Like if I had one arc, I could also say it's a campaign. Yes. Okay. And if I have three arcs, it's, it's a, also campaign. a campaign. I have 20 arcs. It's a campaign. Correct. Okay. So we're all okay with that. The atomic and, unit that we're going to go with here is arc. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples real quick. Uh, yeah, do. All right. First off, uh, every Harry Potter book is an arc. But yes. all of them together are a campaign. Yes. M- not, or, I mean, one by itself is an arc. All of them together. The embodiment of all of them is still one campaign. Yes. Yes. Even the one book, though, could be a campaign. Uh, yeah, because you could have just... I mean, let's be honest. You could have played the first book of Harry Potter. Yes. And mm-hmm. and ended. Yeah, because... And it would have been a quite enjoyable story, right? Harry, Harry discovers he's a wizard. He goes to school. He makes friends. He confronts a challenge. And he goes home for the summer. Mm-hmm. perfectly it's 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 i mean honestly I quite mean, quite neat if they change the ending of that too right where uh voldemort dies from harry touching him boom we're done yeah and and then somebody <laughs> adopts him at the, at the double door adopts him story's over man. boom it, yeah. right it, you can just pack it like, up and go home. that's a that's that's a completed ending the fact that they let voldemort's spirit fly away Correct. and that he had to go home for the summer was the uh thing that made it a, more of a, a nebulous ending. It's as if J.K. Rowling's was hoping 
that the book might be optioned for sequels. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. Just right. Maybe. Like, listen, here's the thing. You're, you're a writer. Um, you've written plenty of adventures. Like, that's a thing you do. Mm-hmm. Like, you put out a kick-ass first book, and you purposely don't close off those things. The same thing happens in movies. You you have this kick-ass movie, and then you purposely don't close it off in hopes for the option to pick it up. Yeah. In other words, the next arc. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, another example for those people who are Harry Dresden fans. The first book of Harry Dresden actually is pretty tidy at the end of it the only question that's left out there that nobody really thinks about is how did victor sells get the power that he got mm-hmm. and that's the open-ended question and, and i know you're not a harry dresden fan so it's, it's fine no it's not even a fan just haven't read yeah okay um so that that is a more tidy ending but it still left it open to ask that question later and if it never had gotten answered could have just the been book would have been completely satisfying sure absolutely um you know in some ways neuromancer the sprawl trilogy is um kind of an atypical um campaign because it shifts there looks like there's a shift in characters but gibson does this thing where he likes um disparate threads to converge Mm -hmm. so you don't see it as much in neuromancer because neuromancer is a heist yeah but when you get to count zero count zero is like four different threads and you have no idea why he's telling you the story until the last two chapters when all four threads converge yeah and then Mona Lisa Overdrive is the same thing, except it now pulls back characters from the other two books. Oh. Like, it's a it's a strange, it's more like, and I'll plug um, Panda's Talking Games real quick, in the Grant Howitt interview, where he talks about the structure for Unbound being five session arcs, and mm. then you could just play different arcs in the same setting. Yeah. That's what the Sprawl trilogy is. It's a lot like what I did with the Airy Peaks, where I could actually look at different characters, and it was all surrounded in this one space, right? Yeah. Like, you had different threads all dealing with this. I mean, it's not the exact same thing you were talking about. It's just another way to look at that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, do we want to just make up um, an arbitrary term for short and long campaign? I think... Based on arc? Well, uh, I mean, it's arc and multiple arcs. <laughs> well, so let's just say short arc, um, for the sake of the rest of our conversation, uh, one to three arcs is a short campaign. I think one arc is a short campaign. Anything longer than that is a long campaign. That's fine. That's fine. I, I'm I'm totally okay with that. One arc is a short campaign. Because an arc is still a subjective term. Like, it could be it's, X amount of sessions. I am perfectly fine with that. Okay, yeah. so we're going to call short campaigns one arc and long campaigns greater than one arc. Yeah. Done. Okay. Um, if you can live with that and I can live with that, let's talk about the advantage of a short campaign. And some of the challenges of a short campaign and stuff. And yeah, like absolutely. How to do it. So that's what we're working with, people. Think about that. If you have any disagreements with us, feel free to email us, or get to the G Plus community and tell us we're wrong. Yeah, Whatever. yeah. You, it, by all means, flood it. Yeah. All right. So, short so, campaigns, one arc. Yeah. So it's a it's cool. It's cool because it's a short term commitment. It like, is a short term like commitment. Cartel was a short term campaign. It was an arc. It was an arc. Yep. Yes. Because uh, there were in the in the sessions that we played, it felt like there were there were multiple of these cycles inside of them i would agree or or disparate cycles telling a a a converging story yeah yeah absolutely and and it certainly had a climax yeah and it was very specific it it was and when it was over it was pretty clear it was over Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there were bodies all over the place yeah yeah um yeah and so again i'm again i'm gonna plug um panda's talking games really quick grant how it brings up a great point about why short-term commitments are good like it gives you, it does a couple of things. Um, it sets expectations really quick. It does. Like we're going to play this thing and it'll be done in five sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, it'll be done when it's done. But it, it doesn't assume forever. Correct. So it, it actually has a beginning and end. And it lets you, it lets people then commit like, well, I don't think I can commit to playing every week for the rest of my life. But if I asked you, Chris, for the next five weeks, could you commit to playing Fall of Magic? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. Let's play that game for yeah. five weeks. Five weeks and then we're done. We just put Fall of Magic away. We'll be done. Okay, so I, I like that. What else? So uh, as we said, it's a great way to tell a specific story. Yeah. So the when we played Cartel, it was the story of those people in that short period of time when things were going crazy. Because the there was one a traitor inside and the Federales or whoever were even in our the feds territory. were coming in and there was actually an outside force trying to push on on uh, El Jefe. Yeah, that was the story that was being told. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. 
And um, it, it's also a really good way to get into a system, to, to give it a try to see if you like it. Because then you can play that short arc, and then if you really want to play it more, one, well, you can still play that game, or you can play, or you can start over and, and plan something grander. Yeah, like, for instance, um, a lot of people say this by Powered by the Apocalypse games. Really, the sweet spot is about four to five games to really hit all the high, like high notes of the system. Um, and I can say this for certain, that in Hydro Hackers, you can play Hydro Hackers as a one shot because I've kept that in mind because, you know, I'm, you know, best friends with Senda. And if I didn't make a game that couldn't be played into one shot, certainly there'd be some ridicule. Um, True facts. You can play it as a one shot and you can play it as a campaign in a single arc. Um, and you won't see all the nuances of the game until you play it as a as, in an arc. Yeah. Because you can't you can't in a one shot do the neighborhood mechanics. Yeah, it's a bigger, it's a slightly bigger game. It's got some extra stuff on, on yeah, it. Yeah, if you're going to do the one shot, I run a heist. You go steal water. It's fun. It's got a bag full of tokens and shit like that, and it's fun. If you're going to do the, if you're going to do the arc, then we're going to play out probably one or two hydro hacks around the neighborhood. Well, here, I'll kick one to you. You can't, you can't play, I mean, you can play Mouse Guard as a one shot, but it doesn't feel right until you've played it so you can alternate the, uh, the, um, the player's phase and the game master's phase yes. like three or four times because then you see the game yep. like not just see it then feel it then understand it yeah exactly yeah so it's a it gives you like here's the difference like a one shot gives you like the free hit right sure. like, like yeah one the first hits free kind of thing mm -hmm. the short campaign uh lets you see the whole like you get to see all of the mechanics yeah. at least once. So like Knights Black Agents, terrible one shot game, man. It's a hard one shot. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to get to do all of the cool things. Like That's right. You're going to get to do you like you have to pick them. Like if you're designing a one shot for Knights Black Agents, you got to make some you got to make some decisions like I'm going to do a car chase and or then, I'm going to do a parkour chase. Yeah. But I'm probably not going to do a parkour chase, uh, a full break in, a hack um, investigation and fight vampires. Ah, that's a that's a lot to yeah. Like you're shove gonna, in there. You're gonna pick like three things of the all the cool things, and you're not gonna see the some of the meta rules like the, the heat rule, man. Yeah, the, the heat rule. Like you're just, not you gonna, might as well torch Paris. Yeah, man. You're not gonna see the uh, the Van Pyramid uh, reaction chart. Correct. Like you're, you're not, not gonna, gonna move up the Cos Pyramid. Correct. Right. Um. You know what? The, you know what? Another game that's exactly like this, Burning Wheel. Yeah. In fact, in fact, Luke actually has said. When learning Burning Wheel, don't do all the subsystems off the no. off the bat. Do the core system, and in in an adventure, just focus on like one of the subsystems, like Duel of Wits or um, the fighting one or the archery, the range one. Mm -hmm. Okay. But on the bright side, in in these short campaigns, in these short arcs, if you're gonna play for a number of sessions, you can pick out pick out and put these things in the game Absolutely. which is why they are better functioning i think in a lot of ways for showing that stuff off than a one shot yeah i mean you can get a taste of all that you won't master it all you won't see you won't get all of the crazy cool like interconnectivity of all the systems the that nuance. people are designing designing yeah the nuances right. like there are things about dungeon world that we discovered and also understood and also played with because we played so many sessions of we'll it. get to that when we get to long campaigns yeah um, what's the last, what's the last advantage? Oh, it's a great way to test new players. Like, oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you, it's hard to get a feel for somebody with one play, but you can get a feel for somebody with, if you, if you have a multiple yeah, plays. Everybody's going to show up to a one shot on their, on their good day. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but, and, and, which is funny because I'm actually, or, pre I'm actually preparing, um, the Panda Talking Games episode for this week on problem players. Yeah. Or, or flip it. Like maybe the person shows up on a bad day and they're not really a bad person. <laughs> right. At least if you play an arc. You get some feel for who this person is. Correct. And let's be honest, if it isn't good and you don't like confrontation, the arc's going to end soon. I mean, come on. We weren't even really good friends until we played Underground. Uh, yeah. And I mean, was, that was a total test drive, right? Yeah. Like that was, that was a, hey, let's play a game with Chris to see if all those things he says on the podcast really match up to real life. Yeah. Um, including the part where it's like he sometimes walks out of games he doesn't like. <laughs> good thing I liked your game. Yeah, that's... I never was, I was never not scared. <laughs> All right. What are the disadvantages? Like where, where, where are short campaigns troublesome? Well, we actually just talked about it. Like there are certain games that just don't fit well. Right. Uh, yeah. Like what, so what's the kind of game like, oh, well, first of all, you mentioned one, 
Um, you mentioned Night, Night's Black Agents, which is indicative of games that have multiple subsystems. Yeah, so games that have multiple subsystems. You uh, you mentioned one in the notes about uh, about long level progressions. Uh, yeah. So I agree with you if you're trying to play the entirety of the game. I disagree with you in certain situations for if you're trying to play a certain kind of story. Well. Although I just had this argument, not no. argument, discussion on Down with d d No, so I'm fine with this. Let me, I'll actually justify my point. If you are going to play an arc... Okay, of D and D, and it's like we're gonna play. We're gonna play. I'm gonna just. I'm. Let's just say I say campaign because I don't say arc, right? Sure. I don't know. We're gonna play campaign of D and D. Everybody start at level one. Okay, the the magic user sweet spot is ten, right? It's level well, ten. It's it's ten, but it's depending on if you're trying to play epic fantasy. But it's fine. Let's we're just playing. Let's we're just playing straight up epic fantasy, right? Ten is the sweet spot. Are you okay? You did that breathing again. Yeah, are you mad at us? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I had some technical difficulties and I lost the chat room for a bit there. I had oh, okay. to reload. Okay. okay. All right. So so if we just play one arc. Is this going to be a thing? Do I have to check on you every time? Yeah. Every, every, every episode now? Is this breathing thing like, going to be a thing? Is breathing thing going to be a thing? I, I, I feel like it's a th- breathing. If it happens again, it's a thing. <laughs> That's two in a row, man. All right. Let's... All right, go ahead. All right, anyway. <laughs> um, so if you're playing a game with a long level progression and you're and you're not skipping levels, let's be clear, you're starting and going all the way through, then arcs are problematic because you may not reach a high enough level to access the goodies. I think that the fact that you haven't explained to your players what you're actually doing is the well, problematic I mean, a lot of issue. people do this, though. Yeah, right? I know. Like, Maybe they should use different terms. <laughs> well, and here's the important part. So if we are going to play something like D&D, and we are going to only play one arc, then I might say to players, we're going to play an arc 7th to 10th level. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to just drop off the first six levels because we don't need to progress through them. Or so, let me help you out because uh, all the D&D people out there are like, no, that's not what you would that's do. That's 3-5. Like, that's my... Yeah. Ma- yeah. You would you would play from 5th to 9th. Mm-hmm. Or you would play from 10th to uh, 13th or 14th. Yes. So you can actually use long level progression games, but you may need to jumpstart them. Mm-hmm. Like, you may need to say, like, we're not starting at zeros. Yes. And let's be honest, after you've played D&D for a little while, starting at zero isn't really that much yeah, fun. Because we don't want to play a zero to hero game. We want to play sword and sorcery. So we'll play starting at five and strip out a bunch of stuff. Like, for instance, I'm sure the funnel is fun in DCC. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure after you've done like three or four funnels, you're like, I want to use all the other cool shit in this <laughs> giant book. Can we start playing it like seventh level? Something higher. <laughs> yeah. Can we just play it something where I can roll on the other kick-ass spell tables? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. So that was my point about level progression games is that um, if you are going to use them, be cognizant of where you're fitting your arc. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That, that's all I meant to say by that. Okay. Or, accel- or accelerate progression. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's also valuable. Uh, it has its own problems, but it's not a bad way to go about it. Yeah, it's not my favorite. My favorite is actually just like, let's start at a higher level. But you could like, hey, we're going to play an arc and every after every session, you level up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, That's Shadow of the Demon Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, it's legit. Uh, what else? Is there any other disadvantages? Uh, It's trickier to do to focus on the characters. If, if the story is not about the characters initially... Uh, it's harder to make it so that all the characters get the spotlight time or their subplots or their little individual stories. Right, because time you're you're now time constrained. Correct. You can on, you're only you can only fit so much in this arc. Or you have to be super good about tying all of their stories to the main plot, and that can feel ham fisted at times. But if you're good, then you can make it work. Or if everybody's buying in, then you can make it work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. If you're like everybody, tie your subplot to this problem because that's the problem for the arc, then it works better. So that's the way to do it. But it's it's a problem. Like if, if people aren't interested in that, then it's a huge problem. Uh, I agree. So, so uh, <laughs> go ahead. If you're going to run this, um, if you're going to run one of these, what are some tips? Uh, I like simpler stories. Sure. Especially for first arcs. Yeah. If you ever watch any TV show, the first season is always the simpler season. The second season is when things start getting complicated. Uh, yeah, because you actually have the benefits of drawing off of everything that happened the first time. Mm-hmm. You have all of this history. You know what I'm actually going to say? I'm going to say that for a single arc and i'm gonna let, i'm gonna let you add a few more running tips but go listen to pandas talk talking games oh, panda stock games whatever um pandas talking games. that is not what it's called the twitter handle is pandas talking games yes uh, is it actually pa- it's pandas talk, talk games, games is not the stock twitter handle not, not stock not stock send anyway. i got you Senda. i got you um I- go listen to senda's 
one shot advice and scale it up a level. Yeah. It's a lot of the same advice for a single arc. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So keeping story simple, right? An arc should be pretty clear what's happening. Yeah. I'm like, don't wait six. Don't wait six sessions into your arc to reveal the dark overlord. I'll give you another really great tip for if you're going to run a single arc. Right. I love when, when I'm doing my session zero for something like this, like you've all all known each other for a while. Oh yeah. Get rid of that. Like get that shit out of the way. Cause just like you said, subplots, we don't have time to stitch characters well, together. I, 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 yeah. Like, cause you, yeah, yeah, exactly. You, <laughs> st- you stitch all the characters together that way. Like you've been together for a year. You've been dealing with this issue for a period of time. And then you can go around and be like, instead of playing out the sessions, why don't you tell me what happened to you in X? Why don't you tell me what happened to you in Y? Can I tell you my favorite example of this? Sure. But it actually cheats because it does both. It <laughs> stitches the characters together, but also gives them an excuse to come together. Are you going to say the, the fate creation system? No. Okay. Dragonlance. The first Dragonlance book is like, these people have known each other forever, but they scattered to the four corners of the world to go looking for signs Mm -hmm. and are just coming back today. And there's such cool things you can do with that. Right. right? Like at that moment, you're like, awesome. Like they all know each other. And so they don't have to bullshit and like discover each other. Like Tannis knows like the Kender took something Mm -hmm. like Tasselhoff took this thing. Because it's what Tasselhoff would do because they've had that experience. already. Right. So like they were able to like. That's a great, um, it's a great way to do both. It's stitch the characters together, but start them at like, you know, coming together. Fate does a really good job of it with its character creation system. Oh, totally. Because of how you are in somebody else's story to get an aspect. Dungeon World Bonds. Dungeon World Bonds help with that a lot. Yeah. Especially if you play up the, like if you during session zero do the bonds and, and then the game much like fate, ask talk questions. Yeah, yeah. Probe some questions about like, why is that so? Or what happened to make that be? Um, then yes. You get a ton of history then. And yeah. then that helps facilitate you going forward. But by all means, get that shit done in session zero. Yeah. You're <laughs> you're on a limited budget here. Don't spend two sessions trying to get the characters to be um, interlocked. The other one. Don't do that thing. I'm going to say it right now. In session zero as well. You are all here for a purpose. That purpose is the arc. Do not try to sell the players do not try to sell the players on the arc in the first two sessions. Like, you got to go save this thing. Uh, no, we don't. We're not connected to it. Don't do that. Don't. Session zero. You're all tied to this organization, this thing, the powers of good. What? Like, just get that shit out of the way. Yep. I can't stand selling plot to players. Me neither. That shit is, that shit is Actually, 1980s. That is a 1980s problem. That has a 1980s solution. Like, just don't fucking do it. Yeah. Like, as soon as you, if you want that, that play, that character point of view play, that's fine. Start that character point of view play when you start playing session one. Right. But, <laughs> but take your session zero and build all your history together. Right. I, like, it's, um, that is just, like, that is my thing. Don't, I'm not selling the plot to the players. And, and to me, that's a way better, and, and this is, this is for a specific kind of game that we're talking about. Oh, not yeah, yeah. every game, this is for a short arc. Yeah, yeah, we're still in short order. Yeah, like if you want to play the game the other way, there are ways to do that. But if you're only going to have a limited run here, you're just better off this way. Absolutely. Um, all right. So those are some good running tips. Do you have any other like? Do you have any other surefire ones, or do you want to just talk about some games that are like that are good for this? Yeah, I think. I mean, we talked about the mechanical thing. Like, get them in in the sweet spot of play. Hook the characters together before yeah. the game starts. Sell the plot. Pray to God that your game tells you what the sweet spot of play is. If you have a right. if you have a level based game that that has got that zero to hero feel and, to it, and make the problem readily apparent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. You, I I got a couple favorite games for this. I wrote a couple down. Sure. I don't know if you have any that are. Different. I, I actually agreed with most of them, so it was fine. So I like Savage Worlds for this. Savage Worlds is good because you can just pick a experience level and go with it. Yeah, it's really easy. Like yeah. you can just you just pick a tier. And and start right there. It's it's very delineated yeah. in what those tiers are supposed to be in play. Absolutely. Uh fate. Yeah, I mean you beginning you, fate characters pretty much kick ass right they, off they the bat. They do. And if you want to make them a little bit tougher, you can give them a few more points of refresh. Yeah. Yeah. Really easy. Um I mean just give them a few more points of refresh, a few more points for their skills. Right. And and fate, like you said, um, takes care of some of the session zero stuff yes. right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Uh, powered by the apocalypse. It, well, yeah, before you get oh, past that, the session zero stuff, like it takes care of connecting the characters. It takes care of presenting the issues that they're going to be dealing with. It takes care of all of that stuff. Yeah, it's really it's really clean about that. Yeah. Um, powered by the apocalypse games. Yeah, a lot of them because... Um, pick up a playbook. Yeah, pick up a playbook it's and let's start playing. And a lot of times the session zero stuff helps 
uh, create your setting. Or oh yeah, like if you're if you're playing your Dungeon World straight up, there's a session. I mean, there's a session. Well, a, well, you can go back to the OG man. Apocalypse World does that. Like, oh yeah, in your in your session zero, you're building your apocalypse. Yeah, like, and then your together. session zero slash one is you wandering around your world and mm-hmm. starting to poke at it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I so yeah, short. Um, I like all those. I'm yeah, with you. Those are the games that do that well. Other games you're gonna have to work a little bit harder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, again, not impossible. Like D&D, you can totally do it, but you're going to have to make some adjustments. Yeah. I, I think even Gumshoe works good for Ark. It does if, again, you pick and choose. Yeah. And, you know, your Ark is going to basically be one big mystery. Yeah, and, and, like, there might be, like, one or two or maybe, yeah, one or two mysteries within it. Yeah, one big mystery with a couple little mysteries that kind of lead up to how to solve the big yeah. mystery. It's really just one one spine. Oh, yeah. That's yes. a longer spine. Yes. There you go. That's the best way to describe that in Gumshoe. I like it. Okay. On to long campaigns, more than one arc. Okay. All right. Um, what are some of the... Do you want to... You can... Here, you, you, you ask me again. That's okay. fine. Okay. Chris, what are some of the advantages of doing a long mm. campaign? Man, you can tell some epic stories. And by epic, we're talking length and scope. Yes. Like Absolutely. Sp- epically long and epic in scope. I mean, I think this is the reason you do a long campaign yeah, and they feel they feel more epic because like you in a short arc you can tell an epic story because it's about scope right but sometimes it doesn't feel it can fall flat absolutely because you're doing a lot of, like you you didn't you weren't there because uh it's like show not tell yep in, in a lot of that stuff with the short arc we're telling a lot of stuff in that session zero like this is the stuff that we did right before we start playing in the epic game we can start and just show all of it and you're looking at your l hall picture right now I am because I was looking for a, a number, but I can't quite see it. I think it's thirty six. Um, <laughs> thirty six. Well, here's the thing. So L Hall, um, my L Hall campaign, which was my fantasy heartbreaker campaign, right? Mm-hmm. Like this was my attempt at um, at fantasy. Um, L Hall is five arcs. There's five arcs that make up the whole campaign. Thirty six adventures that happen, and more sessions because some of those uh, adventures took multiple. Uh, sessions to complete but essentially and i'll see if i can remember the arcs correctly the first arc is um the first arc is discovering the king um then there's an arc that goes through the desert that leads to um kokala there's an arc that goes through the mountains the stomaglin mountains there's an arc that um goes north there's the war and then there's the final confrontation Mm -hmm. and and so those arcs spanned three years Mm -hmm. three years um, we had like birthday cakes and stuff for this campaign because it like <laughs> lasted three three calendar years. Um, but within each like each arc had a purpose. Like the one the the arc about going into the Stomaglin Mountains was about getting allies for the upcoming war, and the adventures within there were things that the characters did to help those people to make them to allies. make them allies. And so um, it was very fractal in in that respect, like. And the arcs weren't, I I didn't have them stitch rigidly. Like they think, were branch points. Like I think there's want... another, there's another episode in here where we can talk about what an arc looks like to you and what an arc looks like to me. And then, and then break oh, yeah. it down. No, I mean, I, yeah. And I totally can explain it because Ding. that arc yeah. had a beginning, like an overarching beginning, middle end, mm-hmm. but then had like a whole bunch of little um, stuff that happened inside of it mm-hmm. that each one pushed a little closer to bringing the, the main part of the arc closed did you pin that yep good good keep, keep going all right anyway um anyway that's all i wanted to say it was like five arcs and um and it did a thing and it was epic right like it was i mean this thing spanned this thing when i drew it out on a map it like spanned the entire like it zigzagged across the entire continent yeah a couple times mm-hmm. like it was big uh yeah, the area peaks man is an epic story it, it is an epic story it also does the other another thing that's great it it offers a lot of opportunity for character development I mean, Corrin is a perfect example of it. Yeah, Corrin go. I mean, Corrin is Corrin ends the Airy Peaks very different than how Corrin starts the Airy Peaks. Mm-hmm. Uh, Corrin is a very, uh, in in literary terms, a very dramatic character because of how he changes. Yeah. Uh, whereas Bardic is not. No, Bar- <laughs> Bar- Bardic. Bardic is so iconic; it's not even funny. Uh, Bardic yeah. is Batman. Yeah. Right? Like Bardic, Bardic is just bardek through the whole thing and uh throndir is very very dramatic too because of how he grows in his faith and yep. the people that he cares about and what he tries to do yeah i mean um, he always had that that uh that forthright being a good guy uh point of view that but, part never changes but it, yeah. but it grew it just kept growing yeah 
And and so just to touch on that, because we're talking about multiple arcs, story, session, etc., there's so much time to have things happen that change the character because what changed Corin was things that happened inside the game. Yes. Um, and so that's not, we're not talking about it. We showed it. We played it. Yeah, we played it. It wasn't a thing like I just made up like, you know, Corrin's changing. Mm-hmm. Like, no, shit happened in the game. And it was like, yeah, Corrin is now different. Yeah. You made choices that the character was different. Yeah. Some of them were a bit meta for, or they were, they were for meta reasons, but they were all in game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's awesome. What else? So there's a, a lot more opportunities to have characters reoccur. Yes. Especially NPCs. Yes. Absolutely. And if you have a rotating cast of uh, player characters, then also the player characters. Yeah. I mean, it, the Eerie Peaks kind of started with a rotating cast. That was the little, idea. But it cemented after mm-hmm. a while. And, and you see that as well in like TV shows. Like DS9 starts like a little, like it, it bounces around from character to character. But when you get to those last couple seasons, like the writers dialed in, like the writers knew who they liked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, they just drove those characters home. Mm hmm. What's another one? Uh, there's a greater opportunity for system mastery. You're gonna play this game for a couple years. You're gonna get, you're gonna get a chance to a exercise the subsystems, and b you're gonna get to start to see the nuances. Yeah, and there was a thing that happened in our game that I needed to do because it didn't really fit. Like, uh, undertake a perilous journey doesn't work in the area peaks because you're not traveling over a long distance. Nope. But traveling through the peaks is dangerous and unto itself. So I had to write a different move for that. Right. Like I learned a thing. Um, I learned that in Dungeon World, when you get a plus three in a stat, uh, failure starts to become less of an issue. Mm-hmm. Like when Corn got a plus three in strength, Corn didn't really roll a low number to hit. Like it almost always was a seven to nine. Yeah, you were either succeeding or succeeding with a complication every yeah, time. Yeah, very rarely. And 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 the impact of that is that in Dungeon World, failure is experience points, mm-hmm. and it, for Corin hack and slash was the main role that i made every game so all of a sudden around seventh level like corin starts to slow down because you're only getting experience points at end of session right because i exactly i can only find experience points through bonds and everything else which was great because um it actually got me to um work those harder but just getting points like corin stopped having bad nights like there wasn't you know Corn just murdered shit. Yeah, a lot. You stop having those ten experience point nights. Oh yeah, yeah. those are yeah. gone. Which, which is cool for that game for the progression of that game because the game slows down at about fifth level. Yeah, and from fifth to tenth, it's a slower game. It's a slower. It's a slower progression game. But every time you get a level, like it, I mean, at least for us, like it became more epic because you start picking up things like those. Uh, I mean, we made up our own, but it's in the game. Those compendium playbooks. Oh yeah. Like, people started getting stuff like that. Well, I took that one, the Mark of Power. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a narrative thing. Like, it literally, I mean, all it says is you bear a Mark of Power and um, sentient creatures are aware of it and take you more seriously. Yeah, but you also get all those ice powers. Well, that was the Compendium class thing. Correct. But that Mark of Power, for instance, like, I loved that thing. Like, when we met the Seventh Greatest Swordsman. One of the Seven Greatest Swordsmen. Thank you. um, Before I became him. um, That's not how that works. I, you know, like I had to remind you, I'm like, I bear that mark of power because it's not like some chumps just walked into this cave. Yeah. Like at that moment, you know, like he looks at me. He recognized. Right. I look at, I look at him. I recognize. And suddenly that scene is different. Yeah. Because he's just some dude sitting at a campfire in a cave when I come walking in. But then like we sit down and there's like a little moment. Yeah, there's a pal- uh, palaver, man. Yeah. Like there's a moment where it's like, okay, well, you're a badass. I'm a badass. Some stuff's going to happen. We're all cool here. And like, you know, like that. And then when we have to face each other in battle, like it's a thing. Like we both know, like this one's not to be me- like, this one's not to be trifled with. It also, it also means something narratively too. When people, other people get hit by him. Like right. whenever Dave's character, Elwood got hit, he got knocked like 50 feet across a cavern and <laughs> yes. slammed into a wall. I mean, there's yeah. a reason for that. Cause he just wasn't nearly, cause he didn't have that mark of power. Right. But when you fought him, it was different. Yeah. So anyway, um, so reoccurring NPC is fantastic. Yeah. In fact, not only fantastic, encouraged. Yeah. Like if you're running a long game, bring back NPCs. Oh, and then I got to bring back one of the seven greatest swordsmen in the world a couple times. Yeah. Even after he was dead. 
Uh, system mastery, absolutely. Um, you will discover. And we, we just talked about the other one, too, actually explore more player options. Yeah, well, I mean, the, right? So, like, you know, this gives a chance for players to kind of dig through the playbooks or the levels or whatever. And have the, the in some cases, have the story influence the, the uh, mechanical uh, jumps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the fiction influence the in mechanics. Fact, in fact, that's, well, when we get to running tips, that's probably a very good tip. It is. Uh, so what are some of the disadvantages to these long campaigns? Continuity starts to get complex. It does a little bit. You got to start keeping track of, you got to, you got to have a way to keep track of the shit. And I guess I can plug, can I plug it? Hmm. Um, Cause I actually talked a little bit about that on Gnomecast. We did. We talked about this on the Gnomecast, yeah. which isn't, it doesn't exist yet. Everybody, I apologize. Uh, it's being in previewed right now by Mr. Arcadian. But once, but once released, we'll talk about, but We'll talk a little, it, I, I talk about it on that episode, but when you have when you have a long campaign, you need to keep continuity straight because if you break continuity, like look listen, you've all seen this in TV shows and movies. When continuity breaks, it's it, it's painful. It's painful. It's also painful in games. Right. So it is painful in games. And so when you have three years of a running campaign, you need a way to remember who was that NPC mm -hmm. or where was that place? Like you got to start keeping some notes it's and true. you got to start. And if you're doing a good job on a long campaign, you're working some of that old stuff back into your new stuff. So you need a place where you can find it. Reincorporation is super important. Right. And if you're playing like you and I like to play now, I have an activity Ooh. where I keep index cards, obviously, at the table because mm -hmm. I love my index cards. Um, and as emerging elements are created, I write them on the index card. But then I have an activity after the session's over that takes the shit on those index cards and puts them back into OneNote. Yeah, or it, you take pictures of them. Sometimes I just take a picture and put it in OneNote. Yeah. But sometimes I write it out. But the important part is that I recognize that those emerging uh, elements need continuity. Yes. Like they're now trapped in the continuity of the game and I need to be able to find them again. And the other one is that you're playing the same game over and over and same z's one it can get boring i mean let me this is what happens to me with savage worlds i can run savage worlds for like a couple arcs and then i'm like i think i've played all the savage worlds i need to play for a little while yeah like it starts to feel the same which is weird because our dungeon world game it could but it never was boring uh, i never thought dungeon world was boring nope. yeah i don't need, i'll be honest i didn't even think for the times I've run Savage Worlds for for long periods of time, I don't think the game's boring. But there becomes like a a feeling like the mechanics are basically the same. Mm -hmm. I can do a lot to dress that up because I can do the things like we've talked about. I can put a dramatic element in the middle of a combat. I can put a personal story as like a little aside or like I can make that like I can make that exciting. But the actual act of uh, handing out initiative cards, um, you know rolling to see if you're shaken not you know like all those things kind of the same so what's the thing about powered by the apocalypse then that makes us so jazzed about it like it's the six get... minus and the seven to nine so first of all the seven to nine um players always have to pick a thing that complicates the scene mm -hmm. and the six minus puts you into the gm move and no one knows what's going to happen except for the gm and and honestly the gm doesn't know in advance that's true so the gm makes a the gm makes a move how you make that move put that in as a pin how you make that move has Ding. a lot to do with um your own sense of where you are in the story what you think might be interesting and some knowledge that you know that no one else knows because that's the off the off screen stuff yeah that's the off screen stuff um but let's be honest when we played dungeon world and the six minus came up you didn't know in advance not often. where the game was going nope i mean some crazy shit went down in that game because on the fly like Tony blew that role for the lightning hand. That and, was a thing. Right, and and your reaction was, uh, well, it's gonna whoever's carrying it in the next couple turns, it's going to detonate yeah. on them. Yep. Like you just made that up. There wasn't any rules for that. It's true. And, and that's why I think that game doesn't get very samey because um as we've said before when we talked about GM moves, it's the, those are super broad. It's so broad that it lets the it's let the creates it lets the creativity of the table uh make it different. Yeah, and so I like I like let I mean let's be honest, rolling moves is actually very samey, right? Like rolling a move is is not there's nothing original about it. But what happens when you take the move and push it back into the fiction 
that's very unique. Okay. I just wanted to bring it up. No, I was curious. That's good. It, we, it's a little bit of a tangent. Sorry, everybody. No, it's fine. I'm, I'm uh, glad you asked. Okay. But yeah, so sometimes that, and I, and I wrote this one down specifically because this shit happens to me all the time. I start playing a long arc campaign and suddenly I'm like, oh my God, we've played the same system because I'm polygamous, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like I'm looking at six other games on my table and I'm mm. like, oh man, we're still playing. We're still playing D&D, but look, like there's Headspace, there's Night Witches. Dungeon World is the only game that we've played in the last three years that has multiple arcs. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've played a lot of one arc games where we've been like, awesome, played it, high fived. Let's go pick up something else. Yep. Yeah. It's true. It says a lot about the Airy Peaks. Uh, yay. Yay. Uh, okay. How do you run this shit? Yeah. How do you run this stuff? Um. So is that what we're talking about? Running tips? <laughs> yeah. Good. So you, you have a bunch of times so you can play around with stuff. Like, you don't have to just be like, bam, 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 bam all the time. I, I believe it's like Send and I say on uh, Pandas Talk Games. Uh, time. Time. Time is it's on your side. side. Yes, it is. She's going to be so mad that I'm singing with you on the mics. Oh, why? Uh, I think that's our shtick. Oh, come on now. I was singing on these mics before she was singing on mics. Well, that's true. That's true. Anyway, <laughs> um, again, if you go to Pandas Talk Games, go look at the campaign um suggestions because they they do actually apply uh, well to long campaigns it's true that's very much so so time it's is almost your... like our shows are like converging in topics at times yes dangerously mm. so dangerously um, so so time's on your side you're right pace things out like this is a thing that um god i used to have a problem with this as a younger gm like take your friggin' time you know throw in those spacer like those you, when we when we were talking about before about the dark overlord where i was i was just about to do the you know get part one, get part two, get part three. And you're like, no, no, get part one, get part two. Then have this other story where the overlord pushes back, then go get part three. That's that pacing thing. Yeah. And so here's the thing, right? We're talking about pacing, right? It's about beats. I mean, this is beat structure. We've talked about it with, uh, with Hamlet's hit points. I am always of the opinion to do the coolest thing possible, but that doesn't mean I need to rush to the end. Cause there's so many cool things that happen inside of stories. Mm -hmm. But if I, I don't know how to teach somebody story structure in one show or in five minutes like that's a thing that you learn over time with experience and from doing it a hundred times but there's a really nice shorthand out there which is hamlet's hit points yeah absolutely that can get you the real good basis for it and then you can start seeing it everywhere or just go watch two seasons of x-files watch season one and two of x-files everything i learned about campaign pacing i learned from chris carter yeah man and i think that's <laughs> actually a terrible way to do it these days <laughs> it's like I on it, I'm I'm like no, it's I, fine. I get that. I'm glad that you learned it from there. Yeah. Like, I, in to me, if you want to like run successful storytelling type stuff, I think it's Buffy. Uh, I I will not I will not argue in the least because that shows you how to do episodic and meta yeah, at the same time. Absolutely. Like, I mean, wait. although I I will argue that there are plenty of episodic X Files episodes stuffed in the middle of those um in the middle but, of that show. Yeah, but every episode of Buffy, it, most every episode of Buffy is episodic with meta in it. Oh. Then yes, that's, Buffy is a much better example of yeah, that. Yeah, you're yes. getting you're getting episodic and serial at the same time. Yes, that's, Chris, Chris Carter separated those. He did, yeah. and he did them really well. Yes. Like if you're looking for that kind of game where you want to have a bunch of one offs, yeah, but you want to have some meta plot in the middle of it, like every once in a while you have an episode that has meta plot. That's great. But... Nope, you are 100 percent correct. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. Yes. Then then also look at Buffy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And okay. You, and everybody who helped make Buffy the Vampire Slayer, look at their shows going forward. Like, look at Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., man. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is great at that because of who's working on it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, good. I like that. Um. Oh, I talked about this one already. The other running tip. You got to keep a list, man. Yeah, keep you a gotta, list. You got you to gotta, you gotta nail down your continuity. You got to keep some notes. I actually, my uh, my mine for the Airy Peaks is terrible compared to what I usually do. Like, yeah. I have a Word doc or a Google doc these days yep. that has a list of every NPC in every location. It's perfect, and right? And I have one line next to it. Yeah, and then you just grab them out when you need them. Yep, and then I, I know what's going on with them, too, because it helps me remember. Yes. So that's why I have the one line next to them. It's basically what's most recently happened to them. And sometimes I can get a little longer if it's important that the thing that happened to them earlier and the thing that happened to them next so that I can see their history in the campaign it's really useful that way um what else what else we got anything show the passage of time yeah like if you're gonna do arcs multiple arcs like let the players feel that time's moving on that character that elements are being affected by events and time so uh let's talk about the area peaks real quick because yeah, sure i mean that's the one that we that's the best example that i have for it at the moment the the tree 
the forest yeah. when uh there was a game that happened where uh, you, you it was at a campaign and the forest burnt down and you were like let's go get the tree i'm like ah oh, that forest burnt down you can't go like somebody told you in the town yeah, like we came out of the peaks and it was like we came back to town mm-hmm. and corin did what corin did in the early days which was get drunk and whore for like three or four days till he ran out of money mm-hmm. and when he sobered up he's like oh let's go get that tree mm-hmm. and then it was like no the tree burnt down yep. it was like well shit yeah like what are we gonna like I guess we're going back in the peaks. Yeah, and that's just one example of that because uh, the necromancer came and raised a bunch of uh, orcs at the the bone field that yeah. you were killing. So there was raised orcs then. Uh, that he r- messed with the the kobolds. Uh, sometimes you went back to a cave and it was different. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you came back to the peaks after going off to war and there was an earthquake and everything was different. Yes. Like time kept moving on. Yeah, and I think that's important when you're doing multiple arcs. Um, have that have that passage of time because it's what. It's what lets the players feel like things are changing. Yeah, the world is a living, breathing place. Right. Because if that doesn't happen, um, you know, it's another great example. Can I give a TV example? Sure. So Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. So when Deep Space Nine starts, it's been reclaimed from the the Cardassians. Mm -hmm. And it's not working. Like in in season one, there's like a whole bunch of of episodes about the station being broken. Mm Mm-hmm. And them having to do stuff to un like to unfuck the station. By the time the Klingon War comes around, there's this great scene where the Klingons all like decloak outside of D- Deep Space Nine, and up to this point, Deep Space Nine hasn't like has barely had shields, has barely had weapons, let alone been stable enough to fire any of them. And then Cisco makes this like thing where he's like, "I guess it's time to test out our modifications," and he's like arm odd number photon torpedo launchers and like the whole station like fucking torpedo launchers come out of like every like piece of it and you're like what What? like (laughs) that happened because it was he said odd numbered that means there's more (laughs) right right. he's only armed half of them right and then it like they get into because that that was between that was a season um ender and a season opener Mm -hmm. and and so like all of a sudden now you're like what the hell like now the station's like it's doing shit like well. And now it matters. Yeah, and so like you like you see that like progression. It got it got rid of the tag broken and got the tag armed. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then you're like, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, do that shit. Okay. Um, Are we good? Uh, we also talked about we need to. Um, oh, we we did. I had one more note here about managing time between arcs. Mm-hmm. So because arcs are the end of stories. Sometimes you're going to have an arc that's going to kick right into the next arc. Yes. Sometimes you're not. That's true. Sometimes you're going to have an arc and be like, Time passes. well, it's unrealistic for one arc. It hits the next arc. Like, it's crazy to have to save the world twice in six weeks. Yeah, it's true. So sometimes like an arc represents like the highlight of a year. And then you might say like, well, a year passed. What did you guys do for a year? Mm-hmm. Um, and then sometimes is a good way to do the passage of time. It's sometimes a good way to... Um, create a space where characters can kind of give themselves a chance to change. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, in Dragonlance between the first three books and the second three books, like Caraman hits some hard times, man. Like, you know, Caraman's like, well, the war is over. I'm going to just go get fat and drunk and drunk at at, back at the bar. And then it's like, well, we need to go do a heroic thing. Let's go get Caraman. And it's like, (laughs) Well, shit. Yeah, Tesla like, was like, come on, Karaman. And Karaman's like, I'm a fat old guy. Like, let's get you in your breastplate. Nope. 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 <laughs> and, you know, so like, that's that thing where time had passed and it's like, and reasonably, like, after the war, why would Karaman, like, stay in supreme fighting shape? He wouldn't. Right? Like, he was a simple guy. Also like, lost his purpose. Right. Like, well, he was a simple guy. He got married. Mm-hmm. Op- you know, took over the tavern. Yeah. Did what you do when, you know, like hung up a sword. Yeah. Then he went and fought in an arena and did extra calisthenics for food. Well, see, that's, you know, that was one of wisely. My, one of my favorite moments in that book, by the way, this is the test of the twins. Yeah. I love, I love those three books. Right. Karaman's in the uh, arena fighting. And it's almost supposed to be fake and whatnot, but he's like doing extra calisthenics afterwards and after like everybody else's exercise. And Tass is like, man, what are you doing? He's like, they won't feed me more if they, I don't do the extra calisthenics. And Tess is like. What are you doing? Like, that's the only time I've ever seen Tasselov be like, what is going on? Because Tasselov is pretty much up for anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, you are such a moron. And Tasselov never says that to anybody. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Right? And and so when you're managing between those arcs, consider oh. having that passage of time and having like a 
session that's just a narrative thing where you talk about like what's happened yeah. during those the, what's happened during that that inner that inner space and we did I, that i will say that those kind of things help to make those long running campaigns more memorable oh yeah cuz it cuz those things become player like they become player investment yeah. moments and okay so real quick when you do that stuff there's two things one um let let the characters the players have their characters do meaningful things like in uh i like to use the area peaks cuz it's the best no, it's example fine. i Good. got Elwood got to become the new the new Smith because in the previous arc the it was discovered that the Smith was the leader of a cult. Fucker. <laughs> yeah. Uh so he became the new Smith. Uh you went away for what? Well, uh, I was in camp in, in Airy Peaks campaign time. I was gone for what, six months? Uh two months. Two months, but it was really two years. Yes. In the Queen in the realm of the Queen of Horfrost and Woe. And we didn't and it was like a mystery of what happened to you while they were while Right, you were because there. what we see at the end of that arc is I go through a portal. Like, I'm leaving, guys, and I left. Tony's character dies, sort of. And yeah. his, uh, Bardic dies and is taken away by the Crucible. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what happened to him, and we find out at the beginning. There's, There was a number of times, that, not a number of times, there were, there were times that stuff like that happened. Yeah, and, and that's a great one, because it's like, two months pass by, and Elwood's, you know, working away as a smith, and then all of a sudden, like, Corrin shows up, but he's all cold and frosty and, like, has got weird ice powers and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a terrible way to fuel them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I guess that was my that, point was. That's when Lanneth became a direwolf, right? Or did uh, you become a direwolf before that? Either way. Yeah. Somewhere in there. One, yeah. of, those, one of those gaps. All right. Let's, uh, let's just round it out. What are games that are good for? Um, Dungeons long? and Dragons. Absolutely. Yeah. Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, I never played Shadowrunner Corporation, so talk, talk to me. So the reason I say both of those is because um, Shadowrun and Corporation, to the same extent, are games full of gear. Mm -hmm. And you will never, in a small arc or a one-shot, ever get to touch or play with all the cool gear or have enough money to afford the really wicked cybernetics. So playing in a long arc uh, lets you uh, build up that money ah. and buy, like, you know, the really crazy um, cybernetic shit for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so or have the the story arc where something happens and you can acquire it yes. without having to pay for it. Correct, like you go steal it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you break into the Renraku arcology and walk out with, yep. you know, crazy-ass cybertech that on the next session you've implanted in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I say, like, those style games, because those are the... Um, those are the money games. Yeah, the money games. Yeah. So overall, all this stuff together. Let's just round it out. How yeah, does yeah. this? How does this help game masters and players in general? And uh, I think for me at least, it it allows us and players to one have their expectations set and understand what they're getting into. Yeah, I, I think that if you're a player and somebody and a GM says to you, "I want to play a campaign," <laughs> you should ask the next question. Well, is it like an arc, multiple arcs? How long is this campaign going to be? What right. does this campaign entail? There's a billion questions to ask surrounding it. Correct. And which then all goes to expectation setting. But I think that real one of the real takeaways is campaign is not a unit of time. Correct. Campaign is a type of story. A, a set of stories together. It, or, well, it's, it's a it's a it's a kind of story. It's a bunch of arcs yeah. or an arc one one or more arcs. Right. It's there a shitty go. it's a shitty <laughs> definition. How about we all just admit that maybe campaign should go away? Maybe. Maybe, maybe campaign maybe not go away, but it should be recognized for what it is. It is an archaic term that references the wargaming history of our hobby. Yes. And that arc might be actually the better term. Might be. Might be. I'm going to drag out. You know what? I'm not only going to drag out my soapbox. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Uh-oh. I'm putting it right into Hydro Hackers. Do it. I'm we're I'm going to just put a paragraph in that campaign's a terrible term. This game's about arcs. Okay. I like it. What's going on in the chat room for life, Bob? Well, let me just say. Are they yelling at us? No, but they are uh being ridiculous. Usual. They are a, a good bunch with lots of stuff going on. We were we were a little loquacious today. Yeah, a little bit. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna run through these and and uh, we'll we'll see if they spawn more discussion or whatnot. But um, so Ange said uh, she had a comment and a question. Something she's been pondering is the value of understanding story beats for the GM. Uh, what do you recommend for GMs who don't feel they're strong on understanding good story beats? Because honestly, some of the bad games I've played are bad because the GM doesn't understand good story structure and the game has no cohesion. 
So uh, it's Hamlet's hit points. Hamlet's hit points just is, just give them that book really the and read key. it. Yeah. Ha- Hamlet's hit points is probably the best explanation. The other one is, um, and I mean, we just talked about two great TV shows for yeah. for learning this, but but TV shows are a great way yep. to learn this technique. And and nowadays, I mean, nowadays, honestly, most um, most most dramas and most um, I'll just say geek style shows have tuned into this arc meta plot kind of thing. Leverage did it for many seasons. Leverage did it for many seasons. Um, uh, one of my favorite um, p- police procedurals. Um, now, Criminal Minds does it, but that's not my favorite one. Um, Major Crimes. Mm-hmm. Major Crimes has a way of doing this. Um, there, like, if you, I wrote an article a long time ago on Gnome Stew about feeding your creativity. Mm-hmm. Like, the best thing you can do is consume. Yeah. Like, go watch, go watch like six seasons of Buffy. Like, feed your head. Watch two seasons of Supernatural. So the <laughs> yeah, the first time I ran into this concept before I read Hamlet's Hit Points, I was talking to an author at uh, Gen Con about seven or eight years ago about their book and they were like what i did when i went through and edited it is i took a bunch of different highlighters and when there was a personal beat for a certain character i highlighted it in a certain color when there was a uh, a beat for a character when there was an action beat i highlighted it in a certain color and they just went through the different kind of beats and said i highlighted it in certain colors and if there was too many of the same color on a page then it was problem yeah like and that's how you can, that's actually a visual representation of it. And that's the whole idea behind Hamlet's, Hamlet's hit points. If you have three fights in a row, you cannot have another fight. Like, Yeah, you actually become numb to it. Yeah, because it's like, why did we just have this third encounter? Uh, but if you have a fight with us, and then in between it, you have like a conversation that is meaningful and not, or even you have a humorous beat to go with it, then you have these different beats that go together. So um, it can get crazy if you're if you're trying to use too many different kinds of beats. Right. Like that's when you get to ludicrous. And that's the spice. That's the spice theory, right? Yeah. Like beats are like spices. Don't try to put twenty of them in one dish. Yeah. Like a couple and in moderation. Yeah. The firm advice that I try to give people when they ask me this question because I get I actually get asked this question a lot because I talk I talk about story beats. Sure. Um, know what your game is about. Like the two or three things that your game is actually about. Right. Uh, and then those should be your major beats yep all the time you want to make sure that you don't that those are the things that permeate your game mostly yeah and then those spice beats those other things that's that surround it are the things that you dab in every once in a while just to throw in some variety right and that way your game doesn't ever feel boring what is and i i just want to reference this because i love i love the scene but i can't remember the name of the movie what's the the what's the horror it, it it's horror the one with the the intelligent sharks and Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, oh, Deep Blue Sea. Deep Blue okay. Sea. If, if you want to talk about great beat structure, right? Like, the scene with Samuel L. Jackson, like, up to that yeah. point, like, all shit's gone crazy. And then there's, like, this moment where he gives, <laughs> like, the speech. Yep. And then the beat changes. Because he gets eaten. Because he gets just, just fucking eaten right there. And, like, you know, because when you watch that movie, you're like, you know, like, first of all, it's tropey, right? Like, because mm-hmm. there's always the heroic speech. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, it's heroic speech time. And then... Bam! Fucking eaten. You're like, like you jump in your chair. You're like, holy <laughs> shit! Like, yep. That's um, but that's that beat structure, right? Because yeah. it, it's intense. It's intense. It's intense. You have to let off the intensity, so you switch to an interpersonal, uh, talkie for mm-hmm. a lack of a better term, scene. And just as people are catching their breath, bam! The intensity kicks back up. Yeah, because you're you're trying to get people. And you literally need that because if you had just had intense scene, intense scene, intense scene, and then Samuel L. Jackson gets eaten by a shark, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't hit. Yeah. No. But when it slows down yep. and then he gets eaten, it's a thing. That's why if you watch Guardians of the Galaxy, it does action, comedy, and uh drama, I guess. Not I don't even know Man, if it's drama. I wish there was a level I wish there was a level of that Patreon where you could just make Robin do the um do the Hamlet diagrams for, for different movies. Different movies. Yeah. Because that movie that that Guardians? Would actually, I don't actually patronize their Patreon. I pa- right. I don't patron their Patreon, uh, because I I might just if I could get if it on I could that get level. on that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because if he did that for Guardians or would, if anyone did it for Guardians, yeah. maybe somebody already did. I haven't checked yeah. Google, yeah, but that but you're absolutely right. Like the thing, and we talked about this years ago when Guardians came out. That movie hits because the beats on it, um, vary so nicely. 
that um, it's really enjoyable. Yeah, nothing sc- nothing feels worn out. It's not too funny. Mm-hmm. It's not too. Um, the pacing is near perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 never too funny. It's not funny for a long stretch of time. It's never too action packed. Like it keeps switching. Yeah, and it becomes. Yeah, it becomes really comfortable. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to. Push us through yeah. a couple more things. Since it's, we we're an there. hour and 40 in and it's 1025 at yeah. night. <laughs> um, uh, Flat Verm. I believe that was Rob That's Abrazzato, Rob Abrazzato. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, Rob. Rob. For a second there. Uh, he was wondering if there was really any structural difference left between a one shot and a short campaign. Are they both just one arc games? No. Is it? Not really. Uh, you can fit more into an arc. Yeah. It's, it's scale. I mean, it really is like one shot arc multi arc. I mean, if you want me to kick it into uh, narrative terminology, which I don't think it's exactly perfect as, as far as like writing, uh, like a one shot is a short story, a uh, an arc is a novella, and a campaign is a novel or a series of novels. or a series of novels. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I'm a little behind that, uh, but uh, we're going long. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> um, Uncle Ook mentioned that Critical Role is a perfect perfect illustration of a long running yes. campaign built from smaller arcs. With hints at the bigger world. Correct. Mm-hmm. So that was a, a, a good count. That's because Matt Mercer is really clever. Yep. And uh, Avi the Jackal. Hey. Wants uh, to know. Avi. Avi. Uh, yeah. uh, Sorry, I have to wants do it three, three times. Phil can put together a diagram of nested examples of a session story arc and campaign in his Iron Heroes game. Yeah, would you mind pinning it? Because I think yeah. I can. I, I think I could probably. I think I can actually. I think I can not only. I not Ooh, only can diagram Patreon it. Patreon exclusive I, at $240. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to diagram the whole campaign, but what I will do is I can Ding. actually, I can actually in a graph, in a graph show here were the arcs, and then within an arc I can say here were the adventures within it, mm-hmm. and then I might be able to actually from my notes be able to tell when a um, particular story um, went multiple sessions because I often left myself like I would often leave myself follow up notes mm-hmm. so that I knew what to do when I came back that like the following week. Nice. Yeah. So I actually think I can show that in um I could do it basically like a fractal like I could show yeah. the whole thing one arc and then zoom in on just like all the way down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I cool. think I actually could do that. I I can't promise when I can do it. Yeah. But if Bob puts it in, I'll yeah, put it on my to-do list. I I will I will monkey around with it. Be right. fun. It'd be and, fun to uh, do. I'll wrap up the chat room uh, segment with um, Troy Taylor. Hey, Troy, what's Gnome going on, man? Zone? He wants to know how do you keep Dungeon World from hitting a speed bump if one player isn't creative or story drive now? Uh, oh, it's it's about sourcing the table. Like we we just we yeah. we assume when we play the game, and we probably don't talk about it enough. Like, and we do talk about it a lot actually. That um, when somebody can't think of something, everybody starts helping. Yeah. And, and that like that's a thing that we do at the table. Like we, we agree that that's how we're going to play and that's how we play the game. Yeah. And, and the rule is that um, and it's informal, but the rule is the player gets first crack at it. Yeah. Everybody shuts up. The player gets first crack at it. And if the player gets stuck, they can just say, um, can I get a little help? Yeah. Or if there's a hesitation, somebody can go, can I? Right. Can I it's always an ask. It's yeah. never a push. It's yeah. always like a can, can I make a suggestion? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then sometimes the GM will say. Do you want to do you want to ask the table? Yeah. But yeah. it's I guess what I guess what we try to do is we don't like we don't have people um, pile on. Yeah. It's a it's a wait. Yeah. A, and be asked thing. It's a wait and be asked. Yep. And sometimes like I've done it where I've I've put something out and then I'm like, oh, it seems kind of weak. Like, can anyone buff that up? Yep. Or, yeah. you know, you know, and somebody will be like, yes, that. Yep. And do this as well or you're the person that oh, i'm sorry yeah and that's a culture shift like yeah. that's not a way that no, certain people that are is, ex- <laughs> that are accustomed to playing that, that, is, that is a culture shift yeah it's and a cult- sometimes when the person gets stuck um the the if somebody else starts to interject sometimes that's enough to, to yeah kick oh yeah yeah like ideas beget ideas yeah. Yeah, that's like that's some, one of the best ways yeah, sometimes the suggestion it. is all you need to hear and then you're you're off so i i've done it as the gm where like i've come up like it's time for a gm move and i don't I'm not in love with any one particular move. And I'll just ask the table, like, what do you guys think happens? Mm-hmm. And then I'll usually tell, say something awful. Right. And then it's like, oh, yeah, of course. We always go for the most awful yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Awful. All right. Good. Yeah. There's coins. There's many, many coins. Many much coins. Oh, here's a diamond. Why, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah, one for you, Bob. All right. All right. So this is the extra dimensional. It's still the extra dimensional, and it's the extra dimensional social media depository where we talk a little bit about what's going on in the world. So uh, weight loss update because people were doing it for me because Monday was a bad day for me apparently, 
And so with our weight loss challenge that's going on right now, David Walker, thanks for starting it up for me. Randy Farmer, uh, 258, down another half pound. He's uh, 12 of 20 down. So good job, man. What about you, Bob? I am up. <gasps> Buck 92. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I need to crack down. I've been bad. Uh, Chris Shorb, his starting was 223. He's at 218.8. His goal was 203. So he's he's still down. That's good. That's good. Uh, Sean Nicholson, his starting was 186. His target is 175. Last week he was at 184.7. This week he's still at 184.7. So he's holding steady. And that's good because it was Canadian or real Thanksgiving if you're Sean Nicholson. So uh, that's a win. If he can keep the eating down at second Thanksgiving, he'll be okay. I'm actually holding even at 336, um, having done nothing to... Um, I had a weekend, yeah. and I would have expected to be up. I've somehow managed to uh, not, and I'm, I mean, I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm sketchy yeah. because I don't want to take it for granted, yeah. but I feel like, I don't know, I'm not really doing anything right now, and to be honest, every time I go to Starbucks to journal, I, I wind up eating like a muffin or something because I'm like just, I'm now piling through pain. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to eat this muffin and write about sad stuff. <laughs> so. So David Walker is my hero? Yeah. Because David Walker did he do it? He got it. His goal was two hundred seventy. He's down to two hundred six. He's down another. He's down another one point five pounds this week. He's down like forty one pounds since we started this crazy thing. Yeah. It's awesome. That's yeah, it's really amazing. incredible. Yeah. Although he has his he uh, he made the Dune reference that fears the mind killer. He had a particular goal when he started this that he didn't want to say out loud to get under two hundred by the end of the year. It's awesome. And he can do it. He's so close. Yeah, he can do it. You got this, David. And, and thank you so much for being the mensch of weight loss for us all. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so supportive of everybody. Yep. Uh, Rob Whitaker, his current is 196.8. His goal is 189. He is really close, too. He's only a, a, a little a little under eight pounds away from his goal. Uh, Troy, Troy, down three pounds. That puts him at 234 of his target of 230. He's only four pounds away, too. And he said, thanks for all the encouragement. The last two weeks were birthdays in the house, but I had incentive, thanks to this group, to keep my cake eating to a moderate level. Good job, Troy, man. That's awesome. And uh, Troy also thanked, uh, uh, Troy also said uh, good job to David for achieving his goal. Matt Bonhoff, uh, he was started at 235. His current is 225.5. His goal is 225. He's only trying to lose 10 pounds. He's almost there. Good job, man. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, by Grabath's hammer. I hit my goal next week. Oh, that's good. That's a that's a um, space quest reference. Galaxy quest. Galaxy quest. Thank Grabthar's you. Grabath's hammer. Thank Grabath's hammer. Nice. All right, Gil Gore, the edge. His last week was two seventy six. Today he's at two seventy point five. He's trying to get the two sixty five. Uh, he back to the gym. I went last week and headed out after this post. I was posting on the general feed, but uh, I guess. But now I'll post here, hoping I can make it to my two sixty five by Halloween, and then reset the two sixty by Thanksgiving. Also, nothing like watching Luke Cage while hitting the treadmill for 45 minutes. Best of luck to all. I would like to see some before and after pics when we're done in December. Nice. So I recorded with PK yesterday. Man, yeah. he looks thin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, PK had a post somewhere else, but I don't have it What'd up right now. What'd you record with him? Hmm? What'd you record with him? Down with D&D. Oh, nice. We were talking about uh, whether D&D was a... Well, I'll talk about it later. Man, that guy, that, guy, that guy makes the rounds on Misdirected Mark. Doesn't he? Does he want a show? Uh, he's too busy to have a show. I... I, I punched him about like his uh where's the rebels uh review uh podcast not that it would be on on our network but i could start a whole new network just for entertainment stuff yeah, you know he's kind of like he's he's uh he's like almost like the joan rivers like like the go-to <laughs> like well we don't have a we don't have a host uh where's pk i can't wait to, i'm gonna go hang out with him in uh in chicago in december yeah that's so. awesome uh, he said 241.6. He's down more than this. I think he's like at 235 again or 236. Uh, he had a rough go of it with his uh, with his grandfather dying. He, yeah. he ate his way through That's... that, but he kept exercising. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, fu I mean, funerals and family things yeah. like that tend to wind up being a lot of food. So he got um, he kept his exercise routine up, even though he let his diet stuff go because he figured it'd be easier to get his diet back going on. And he has. And he just dropped all that weight again. Like his metabolism is just still killing it. So. So good job, PK. Fantastic. And thanks for coming on the other day, yesterday. All right. That's the weight loss uh, challenge. Okay. Community chatter. A couple of things. So many table selfies. Angela was just posting table selfies everywhere. It's like she was having a mini convention with her friends. Yeah. No one owns table selfies like Angela. Owns Angela is the, selfies. yeah, the, the queen of table selfies. Are we safe to say that? Queen of table selfies? That, um, safely think we can say that? Yeah. Without I think we upsetting say the other queen? Yeah. Well, she's the queen of the chat room. Yeah. And maybe yeah. the Queen of Misdirected Mark. I don't know. I feel like I, I just sit in the background and, and hide. 
Uh, Jeremy Downey asked if I was going to be at a Ketacon and what days I will be there. I yes, will ask, I will be there too. Yeah, we will be there <laughs> the entire time. Uh, and Jeremy, if you come out, I will run a game of the Airy Peaks for you. Yeah, Jeremy didn't ask if Phil was going to the to Ketacon. Because we all just... know that you're going. It was it was in know. question. Why is, why is it was in question. Well, I, that I wasn't going. Remember, I said I, I might not be going a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah. yeah and then that. and then McClure that said I could sleep on his floor. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ovi Waxberg hit me with a pronunciation guide. Uh, Hamish is actually pronounced Hamish, not Hamish, because I pronounced it Hamish, but it's Hamish. Yeah, I think that uh, plus one forward also clears that up. Yeah, Hamish. I got it right. See, this time Hamish. I got it right. Yeah. All right. Uh, and Chris Shore brought up a blog novel basically serialized novel called worm so if you like masks the rpg and you like reading fiction he wanted to direct people's attention to this novel called worm well it's like 10 novels it's like 1.7 million words so if you're bored and you want something to read Hmm. it's there and it's complete and it's pretty good it started in like 2011 so it's like it's teenager superheroes uh end of the world violence gore angst all that romance type stuff so there it is man if you if you like that go check it out there's there's a link I'll probably put a link in the show notes, but there's definitely a link in the community. So you should just go join the community and find it and click on it. There you go. There you go. I saw it. It was good. I mean, I saw the, I saw the link for it. All right. I'm going to do some some Kickstarter spotlights. Yeah, light it up, man. All right. First one is Upwind. It is a game that is kickstarting right now. Uh, in concept, it is an RPG of lost science, elemental magic, and uncharted skies. You will join the Explorers Guild and sail into the Twilight Frontier. So I'll tell you all three things about the game now. The setting, the characters, and the system. Because I feel like that's pretty much the game, right? Okay. In brief. The setting. Upwind presents a fantastical setting where the remnants of a broken world drift as floating islands through a sky divided into light and dark. The kin inhabit the skylands of the kingdom in the light, while the children of the dark dwell far below where the light does not reach. The wind is a powerful force energizing the wondrous machines of the kin and charging the elemental potential all kin wield. Lost technology is the currency of the kingdom, scavenged from the remnants of the masters of the wind, a culture destroyed long ago in a great cataclysm known as the Downfall. So that's the setting. It's a little Miyazaki. It's a little, uh, a few other things too. Do you know the name of the designer for this? It's, I forget his name, but he was just on Jim McClure's show. Mm. There you go. Bob will look it up. So as characters, what you do in this game, you are, um, so upwind campaigns focus on the exploits of the Knights of the Explorers Guild, storied skyfaring explorers, scholars, engineers, elementalists, and soldiers who search the twilight frontier for lost master's caches. The player characters are rare, highly trained individuals with exceptional skills and elemental powers. Duty-bound to the guild, they lead missions across dangerous skies and expeditions into the uncharted dark. And uh, the system, real quick. Upwind uses an original game system called Q. Rather than shape the narrative by resolving character actions one at a time, Q works through a sort of quantum mechanic resolving entire encounters with single plays. Two potential outcomes are negotiated cooperatively and proposed as, as stakes for which the participants bid using hands of playing cards. Another game that hates dice, apparently. Yeah, well, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> the narrative is then tailored to the winning outcome, and the story progresses in a quantum rather than incremental way. As a result, Upwind allows you to tell your story three times faster than with typical incremental systems, which I don't mind. It's just a bit of a zoomed out thing. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a. Um, I think that's terrible. I think that's fine. Yeah, so that's Upwind, and yep. a bunch of people are talking about it. Darcy Ross has been talking about it. Yep. Um, a bunch of people backed it already. I saw. I believe uh, Rich Howard backed it. Yep because I followed him on, on Kickstarter. Nice. It's from uh, Jeff Barber from Biohazard Games, uh, Stuart Week, Wyke from okay. Nocturnal Media. These folks have worked on a lot of other, well, yeah. like they worked on a bunch of yeah, uh, Blue Blade World, World stuff. Yeah, Blue World, I think, was one Blue of them. Blue World, yeah, is one of theirs. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. No, it's fine. Just right. curious. The other one is uh, City of Mist, which I read this entire Quickstart game for this today. It's coming to Kickstarter soon. It's Kickstarting October 20th, so I'll probably let everybody know next week when it pops up or in a, in a couple of weeks when it pops up. So uh, the high concept of this game is City of Mist is a role-playing game of film noir investigation and super-powered action. It is set in a modern metropolis rife with crime, conspiracies, and mysteries. So it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game, but it uses a tag system and a lot of stuff that we put in the part-time Gods of Fate. Interesting. Like, a lot of the ideas there are ideas that we used about how you have uh, the balance of your life. Sure. Yeah. How you have your, uh, they call it Mythos and Lagos. There's also a couple other things. In there, um, as characters, you are playing gateways, ordinary people who become the living embodiment of a legend, their mythos. While your gateways may seek to strike a balance between the mysterious nature of their mythos and their mortal aspirations, the powers within them always threaten to tear their lives apart. Sounds familiar, familiar, right? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. They have unwittingly become a part of a secret world of clashing stories, and soon other legends will come looking for them with demands. Yeah, very similar. A little bit. But it's powered by the apocalypse, so I was like, all right, this is cool as hell. Could've, we could have made that game. We could have made that game. <laughs> 
I actually can. I actually want to re. I could reskin this game to be par- part-time gods of fate with or powered by the apocalypse. Seriously? Part-time gods. Yeah, I mean it's good. I mean, I mean, look, powered. Uh, part-time gods of fate was an appealing setting to begin with. This sounds plenty appealing. Yeah, uh, the setting. There's a world of legend, myths and stories, symbols and ideas swirling in a vastness you cannot fathom. They're more real than reality itself. The foundation of all life. The truth is there, but you cannot see it. The traffickers. Is really a, a is literally a vampire. The politician is narcissus himself. The plumber is a primordial reptilian from a time when fire and water were still one. The homeless woman is a revenant, an angel of death waiting for a destined soul. The veil of the mist hides the true world from us. The mist envelops us all in familiar forms, distracts us, and mistakes us, f- and makes us forget the wonders and horrors that lie beyond it. In the city, the mist makes it all legends seem filthy, creased, and washed out. They wear a crust of mundanity and forget what they are. But you, you are a gateway through the mist, and you hope and despair. You can bring your legend to life if you dare let go of the illusion you call a life. So, it takes that Dresden trope of, like, nobody pays attention to it, and it applies a magical veil to it. Yeah. So you can see through it. So you actually know that the plumber is actually a lizard man. (laughs) So uh, that's the game. And I like the tag system it uses, because you don't have, like, stats. You have these tags that are positive Mm -hmm. and negative. So when you do anything, when you make a move, when you trigger a move, you uh, pick the tags and apply, and that gives you your pluses. So it's kind of like Lady Blackbird. A little bit, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, it works. Yeah, it works a lot it's like, like that. Like Lady Blackbird goes Power of the Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Uh, all right. Cool. So that's a. Uh, that's that. All right. Patreon shoutouts. So yeah. Randy Farmer, the old school DM. Yeah, yeah of course. Crushing Randy. it. Yeah, he's yeah. he's been doing the terrain for Sean's new adventure. Oh, it's so Treasure awesome. Treasure of the Broken yeah, Horror. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It must be. It must be so much fun for sean to see that yeah well sean even said on there at one point like oh it's not it's almost like i write some of this stuff so that randy can make it <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh and one of our newest patrons toby senate thank you so much for being yeah thank you patron. Toby. i appreciate it all by way, all means stop he, by the g plus community yeah, he, he's he's in there okay good. Yeah, he, uh, we're gonna make more talky stuff because he was always like go make more talky stuff oh yeah we, li- we yeah. like that part uh todd crapper yes the, the, the he's got that that crappy name apparently <laughs> But he's making a bunch of games. He is making yep. a bunch of games, including a screenplay. Uh, screenplay, and I believe he's working on a samurai western. Yeah, game that that also has my um, curiosity peaked because I like both of those. Things. Yeah, those are really cool things. Uh, Fraser Sim- Fraser Simmons of the Veil, vale, mm-hmm. and who likes to post about a lot of the stuff that we're talking about these days. It's yep. great. It's funny. Yeah. He, he's also the one who posted the uh, the four kids walking the bank picture. Yeah, I'm actually hoping to play the Veil vale, uh, at Breakout. Oh, nice. That, that I, would be that would, on my list of things I would like to do at Breakout. That I actually hope we get to play The Veil vale before that because I have I've been reading it. Oh, okay. Well, I that like too. It, I like it because it's based on emotions. Yeah, that's cool. Like you, you, when you trigger a move, it's based on how you're you like narrate how you fe- you're feeling. Yeah, and then you use that emotion. Yeah, a little. I mean, a little bit like Headspace in that same regard. Yeah, though uh, instead of that that central track, you have your own track. So if you use your emotion too many times in a row, then it gets problematic for you. Yeah, and you get emotionally overwrought and bad things happen. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, and then uh, Blaze Hebert, thank you so much for being a patron. Yes, thank you. Yes, I love it. Love it. Absolutely. Excellent. Love it. Excellent. All right, podcast roundup. I want to talk about our shows first. Yeah, do it. Advantage Insight. They did an episode on props, so that's that's there for those D and T people who want they're all about props, music, anything you want to bring to the table, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, download D and D. We talked about uh, if D and D is a toolkit or a specific genre. It was me, Merwin, and PK. I like it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, listen to that. Uh, Pandas Talking Games chatted with games designer Grant Howitz, who stole into your show. Uh, well, we figured, you know, it's like it's like Candyman. Cha-ching. Like you say, you say, you say his name too many times, and yeah. you know, eventually, you know, he shows up. Uh, just, I'm just gonna say this: um, if go listen to the show, go listen to the outtakes uh, for a very special waveform. And then he sings again song. later. Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of singing in there. Uh, threats from Gallifrey, Garrett. Uh, had Garrett's birthday and then a chat with James Brown about journey mechanics in the one ring. Apparently there's a little bit of audio difficulty with it. Uh, hopefully mm-hmm. that we'll clean that up in the future. Did Garrett get loaded for his birthday oh, episode? I don't, like uh, I got loaded on our birthday episode. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, no. Garrett, Garrett doesn't drink like us. I don't believe that's uh, probably better. <laughs> it's probably better. And then the cipher speak was all about ciphers and settings and basically put together a hacker's guide on how to translate ciphers for different kinds of settings. Oh, I'm so happy they're nice. back. I know, they, I know there was like a little bump for a second, but I'm so glad that... Uh, it's not a short form podcast in this in this case, but that's okay. It's no such thing as a short form podcast. It's like 40 minutes. <laughs> and it's great. An it's 40 minutes of excellent... Yeah, it's more of an it's arc. It's more like an arc. <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes of excellent content. Yeah, well, yeah. that's what I shoot for. You know. <laughs> and here we go. So 
So uh, gaming and BS, the train. They talked about side quests. Did you listen to this? I did. I did. Um, yeah. Side, you know what? I My favorite thing that Brett talked about in a side quest is really the difference between a side quest and what appears to be a side quest, but it's just a stepping stone for the larger arc, like the larger arc. Like that's important. Like there are legitimate side quests are completely detached and, and they're not a, like you don't need to go on the side quest to get the thing to complete the main arc. Yeah. A side quest is unto itself. Yeah. This happened to me in my, uh, my spell jam game. Yeah. One of my players, I offered them like, well, you can make this deal with this guy for a whole bunch of money, but when you sign the contract, uh, then you have then there's a bad thing that happens, and he totally signed the contract. Like a they pool. always do. Yeah, and like he had to do the job in like three days, or he would die. Yeah, so total side quest. Mm -hmm. It was tied a little bit to the main plot, but right. it was like something that they didn't want to do right then. They had to go kill a beholder, and they were only like level five. Oh yeah, yeah, the beholder that almost like vaped them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that happened. Yeah, side side quests are good. Um, side quests are tricky in that um, for two parts. Uh, at least for me, one, I'm improvising my game now. So side quests are, if, if a side quest can come up, it's going to be an emergent kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's likely going to be because of something like that. Like I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a deal and offer you something that's going to trigger a side quest. Yeah. Unbeknownst to me. Yep. Um, I'm not going to prep side quests. Like, yeah, why I mean, well, no, my prep time is like s severely limited. Like I'm not going to prep an arc and then be like, well, I'm going to prep this arc. Plus, I'm going to prep, like, four potential side quests that may or may not get used. Dude, I don't even prep the you know, arc. The arc anymore, man. <laughs> well, I know. But, um, but I mean, that's my point is, like, side quests are hard for me because of economy of time. Like, I'm probably not going to put them in. Now, I may, if an emerging element comes up in a game, I may decide the next session's going to be a side quest and prep it for that. But I'm never gonna have side quests ready to go. Yeah, me, me neither, really. Yeah, like, like they, it could be emerge. that like we get to the end of the we get to the end of a session, and something has happened in the session, and it's like, no, you're gonna have to go do this thing, like you know, like your example, and then I'd be like, well, next session we'll play that out. Yeah, like the thing where you guys went off to war in the Airy Peaks, like. I wasn't planning that, but then it became a, a part of the game. Yeah, that was your fault for it's, offering it up as a choice. Whatever. <laughs> We've talked about my, that before. I don't know if it's my fault. It uh, was still fun. Oh, it was fun, but you like you threw it out and you did not expect it to get taken, and then it got taken. Uh, actually, that's not true. I don't. I don't actually ever expect or not expect something to happen. Except for the part where you were like, well, shit. I still Go back and listen to the to tape, man. It's on there. Dude, I know I said, well, <laughs> shit, but I'm like, once I said, I'm like, well, that's, that was a mistake, but they well, took then it. You, of course you played through. Yeah. I mean, we didn't rewind it or anything. Of nope. course you played through. Anyway, side quests. It's a thing. So, no, she's a super geek, but Sunday was on the GM Showcase. Uh, yep, next week will be, uh, next week will be, she's a super geek. Yep, so GM Showcase, uh, coming of the preacher, preacher. She ran mm -hmm. that. So that, you can go check that out. That's our game. Yes, yeah. that is That's our, our game. adventure. And yes, yes, it is. It's all of our stuff. It's our stuff. <laughs> That's why yes. I'm bringing it up. Uh, talking tabletop. I didn't listen to it this week. I didn't get a chance to yet either. It's on the top of my catcher, and I'm still at the bottom of my catcher. And since my phone's dead, I can't actually tell everybody what I listen to. Except I listen to the graphic novelty podcast. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. And it's fun. Are like, new uh, friends? Yeah, they're the the new segment. It was enjoyable to listen to. They were talking about uh, Transformers and how none of them like Transformers. That's okay. Even though it prints money. Oh, it, it prints money all yeah. right. They were also talking about the dark. Are they Knight. talking about like not liking Transformers in general or like not liking the movies? Because I don't like the movies. Uh, the movies mostly. Oh, the movies suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're freaking terrible. Yeah, they're kind of bad. I all mean, right. there's only one Transformer movie, and it was like in the 1980s, and it was that it was that cartoon when, where they just fucking killed Transformers uh, wholesale. Well, where Optimus Prime died. Yeah, come on. They was like they, they was just to cap off all the other Transformers they murdered in the in the course mm -hmm. of that story. Oh, um, yeah, that's the one. Then, then we got Rodimus Prime. Why yeah, Rodimus was, Prime? That was that was they a little disappointing. They couldn't have picked Goldbug, right? Or Bumblebee, or yeah. whatever. No, no, no. Just Rod, and it's so bad because it sounds like Optimus. Like, and then it says Prime, like, it's cheesy. Yeah. It could have been worse. I mean, mm. yes, it could have been worse. I don't know if it could have. Yeah, could've Rodimus. Septimus Prime. Yeah, Rodimus wasn't terrible. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't great, but. Should have been Bumblebee. It should have been Bumblebee. All right. That's the, he that's the, that's the, uh, that's the hero's journey. That's right. Because he's the little Transformer. That's right. And then he becomes, the and then he becomes the Prime. Yeah, yeah that would have been. 
I mean, it would have been weird as hell, like, you know, the most badass VW bug you've ever seen. <laughs> like, it doesn't carry the same cachet as, like, you know, although Rodimus didn't either. Rodimus was, like, some matchbox car. <laughs> he did. He looked like a fucking matchbox car. Like, not a real car. Just, I can't like, believe this is happening right now. It's hilarious. Like, he looked like some fucking matchbox <laughs> oh. car that you just, you know, like, you know when you went to the store and you were like, I don't know, I'm going to get the Gremlin, I'm going to get this thing, and I don't know what the F this is. <laughs> But I want this car, too. It's accurate. That's Rodimus. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, so next week I'll have more podcasts to talk about because I have to do a bunch of layout this week. So that's what I do when I'm doing layouts. I listen to podcasts. Yeah, that's cool. All right. All What's right. going on in the chat room? Um, we got some guests who I have no idea who they are. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's fine. I put it out there for people yeah. to come out today. Yeah. The dude on the left looks like White Rick Ross. <laughs> I can't tell. Which one of us? Is it you? Huh. I'm not in there. No, they're talking about the like in the, the left. That would be Chris. That's Chris. Hi. White Rick Ross. Who's White Rick Ross? I don't know. I have no idea. All right. Is that, is that all that's going on in the chat room? Yep, that's it. Cool. Neat. Well, then, I guess we should get out of here. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, yeah. Listen, if you're free Tuesday evenings, 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 6.45 p.m. The Queen's Time, come join us live on Twitch where you can chat with the other listeners in the awesome chat room for life and ask us questions. If you cannot make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcasts. And take a listen to some of the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, such as Down with D&D, Threats from Gallifrey, Advantage Insight, Pandas Talking Games, and Cypher Speak with Darcy and Troy. You can and should also check out some of our brother and sister podcasts. She's a Super Geek, Talking, Tabletop, The Shrieker, Knights of the Night, and The Always Amazing Gaming and BS. As always, after listening to the show... Uh, and you disagree with everything we have to say, uh, leave us some feedback. You can reach us directly, Chris at MisdirectedMark.com. That's me. Phil at MisdirectedMark.com. That's him. Uh, Bob at MisdirectedMark.com. That's him. Uh, or send your favorite hentai porn to Mark at MisdirectedMark.com. True facts. Yep. Uh, check out our Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Head over to Twitter, um, and we can do all the Twitter handles here, Let's at DNA Phil, at Robert M. Everson, at Misdirected Mark and at The Light 101. Where you get your smooth jazz all night long. Oh, yeah. And as always, come to the hub of our social media community, our G Plus community. Yay. Uh, join up and uh, have a chance to post things, uh, taunt Chris into arguing with you on the internet, uh, and all other kind of fun things. Yeah, or you can do it on Twitter too, and I will be like, you should come debate me. Because that happened with the MPK. Yeah, but you got to go do it at G+. That's true. If you'd like to be generous, you can back our Patreon and partake in the shout-outs and getting the pre-production show notes and little bonuses like Carry On, Phil Vecchione. Absolutely. Which just came out yesterday. Yeah, I heard. Or this morning, I should say. Oh, we didn't do Rock and Roll Play, baby. So we don't have to read that because it happened. This has oh. been a Mr. Director Mark production. The media arm of Encoded Designs. I will say, mic drop. We out.